G'day brothers and sisters, this is the other Paul and right now you may notice that I'm on my own because shock and horror, Christian Wagner is late to a collab stream yet again. What a shocker, absolute shocker. Um, so he said he'll be here uh, likely within a few minutes of, uh, of us starting, so it should be, should be any time now. But while we're waiting here, let's just take the time to uh, absolutely relentlessly uh, relentlessly mock the Roman church. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. This is meant to be a stream of understanding of uh, what Rome actually believes. And I'll get to that when he when he's here. I'll get to explaining that. But first, I need to find a really cool Sun Tzu quote. Um, understand. Da, 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 da. There we go. That's the one. Yeah, that's the quote I'm looking for. Yeah, so I have a really cool quote by Sun Tzu, a Chinese general lined up for once. Uh, Wagner decides to not be late for once and get on the stream, and then we can actually, you know, begin. But, uh, you know, what can we do? Don't know what this is, but cool. My fave duo? Hey, absolutely. Hey, honestly, this is one of my fave duos as well. I don't know. I don't know if I can pick between myself and Jeff, a goy for Jesus. Or um, funny story about that. Actually, I might get to that later. <laughs> but so either myself and Jeff or myself and Wagner is my favorite duo. Honestly, it's hard to pick. Probably Jeff edges out because like we have the longer relationship. Um, yeah. But otherwise, me and, me and, me and Wagner uh, duo is absolutely beautiful. Oh, man, the hard hitting questions here. You know, I'm going to star that. I definitely will ask him this. Absolutely. Papism is what they believe. Phenomenologically speaking, I think that's um, every worldview. <laughs> Unless you buy, you mean papism is what they believe in the present or something, in which case, ooh, smack, absolutely destroy them. Uh, live now. Just waiting for you. If someone can find, because apparently he's live elsewhere, because he already had a, another stream elsewhere lined up at the same time. I don't think it's his channel. Um no, never mind. It is. Hang on. Oh, 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 oh. Let's let's uh, let's live react to this. <laughs> oh, this is beautiful. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Brilliant copies uh, of this correct text over in Constantinople. <laughs> Since he was making this claim, this is him live right now. He. Uh, Another bishop, uh, Bishop Bessarion of Nicaea, decided that when they went back to Constantinople, he's going to look through the manuscripts. He's like, huh, I wonder if uh, Mark of Ephesus was right here. Let's uh, let's look through all the manuscripts and see what's up. He found two copies, two copies with Mark's reading. Two copies? Two. No way. Two of them. Only two copies? Yeah, so much for, yeah, over a thousand. He found two of them. Okay, really. Yeah, look, okay. And then look, Mark, all uh, Wagner's points Mark here, utterly cringe, fake, copies, fake news, uh, um, like, because like he doesn't all, understand every time that the... Early Mark fathers, both east and west. Greeks. Every time they talk about the Theotokos, they mean they energetic procession. That the father, the Mark of Ephesus uh, that the son sent like, the spirit oh, temporally like, in time. Are, it's none libraries. of this no, substantial hypostatic whatever uh, procession. So he's completely wrong. Um, okay, all the manuscripts so, disagree with uh, him. And then what's even funnier? Oh, I forgot to mention oh, this. Man. What's even funnier? You can read this in this. Uh, I gave the PG reference for the letter to read the Syrian writing about this. Oh, mate, freaking stood me up. It's even funny. <laughs> is that both of these copies, the only... Not, not, not completely stood me up, but like he's doing this now. <laughs> had the original, but they scratched out. Oh, my word. Can't Such a Dalmatian it. move from seeing Can't God Wagner. His crypto Croatness is obvious. Good to see you, pure, co just, pure I'm copium. I'm supposed to live stream with... Please let the whole six, stream just be two. But this ran a little bit longer. Wait, 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 okay, wait. and then yeah. we have this fun reference. This can't get any better than that. I'll be there in a minute, Paul. I'm just, I'm, I'm just, I'm supposed to live stream with him at six, but this ran a little bit longer. Boom! Of Mark Boom! Priority the showing their dishonesty. Priorities, mate. You. So when the Latins at the Council of Florence drew arguments from the words hey, of the great Matt Cyril, you completely denied that Cyril spoke that way. Uh, However, uh, Matt, I hope you know. John I hope you know. I was being a bit memey. Saying the same you know? thing as uh, I hope you realize that. Also, adultery. 
Basil the Great. Oh my oh, gosh. Oh my word. Um, Florence, uh, Mark of Ephesus. Yeah, Mark of Ephesus. He, Mark of Ephesus was the one true church. Everybody was wrong. Anyone who didn't agree with Mark of Ephesus was uh, outside the bounds of the Holy Mother Church. That's a that's a fact. So right, Filioque destroyed. When you even I, 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 I don't make the rules. I don't make the rules. You know. So that he might bring God bless Pastor Jim, last of and among and the greatest among the apostles, peace be upon him. Inshallah, no, no, mashallah, brother. He came to the and papers be trusted with theology if they can't be trusted with showing up on time. On which the phrase was found. True. He was looking for a knife. Very, which he could very true. <laughs> However, the spirit of truth did not allow this to happen. Oh my yeah. word! Okay, let's stop that for now. Um, crap. What am I? How do I fill this? Um. So, I mean, I don't want to kind of describe the whole stream already because I want to do it like when Wagner's here. But in summary, again, for those who don't fully know, this is going to be me with Wagner on the on myths about the Roman religion. Um, because obviously, when people, myself or others or whoever, argue against Rome's claims... Um, this is, it's funnily enough, my, my passion, my, my, my passionate zeal for like accurately understanding the other side before I critique it. I kind of got that from none other than Dinesh D'Souza of all people, just because back in my, back in my libertarian, libtard, lolbertarian days, um, watching all the usual guys, the, the, the true great, the true great saints and holy fathers of, uh, American libertarian neoconism, um, Ben Shapiro, Dinesh D'Souza, um, you name it, the big boys, uh, uh, freaking Steven Crowder, of course, absolutely him. But, um, one thing with Dinesh D'Souza, one line that he came up with, and I think it was in regards to his, I think it was in regards to his Hillary Clinton, um, Hillary Clinton, uh, uh documentary. I'm not sure, but it was basically, look, I make sure that everything I say and do, I, I, I'm accurately representing the other side because like, if you're not, if you don't do that, then there's just no point. Uh, and, and he told, and he, and he talked about how he would actually go to the people on the opposite side, like the targets of his documentary to say, Hey, am I accurately representing you? Um, so that's the, I don't know. I don't know how, but that time of all times is when it just stuck in my brain. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to do that for everything. So yeah, that's kind of why I'm doing this. Um, that's kind of why I'm doing this stream basically to, uh, to help forward that uh, on a number of key issues, including fun fact, the Philly Oakway among many others. So that people uh, who are dialoguing with Rome and critiquing it, we can actually do so from a common basis of right understanding. That's the whole point of this stream. So I hope for it to be very good and valuable that way. 27 people. Let's freaking go. Wow. Christian Wagner is looking good right now. <laughs> Why? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. He seems to have gotten a genetic upgrade with the Lebanese infusion. Mashallah Habibi. Was Mark of Ephesus actually the pastor Jim the whole time? <laughs> we must return to the sources. We must find this out. Uh, ooh, filler content of the Jerome Papal commentaries. That'd be one heck of a primer. Don't mind if I do. <laughs> Let's do it, boys. All right, all right. All right, all right. What's a controversial passage? Um, let's go to... Ooh, 1 Corinthians 14. I... I I, I I almost know for certain what they're going to say about that. They're going to say 1 Corinthians 14 is a, is a repressive and, and it's from a later commentator. It's an interpolation because that is actually a widely held, um, not, not universal, but a widely held scholarly view that 1 Corinthians thought 14, 34 to 36 or 35 to 36, one of those, that's an interpolation. Because of because uh, that's the section where it says women must be silent in the churches, and if they have any questions, they should ask their husbands at home. Um, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God, first of all. Um, but yeah, I, I'm almost certain that's what they're going to say here. So, from the papally approved commentary, ladies and gentlemen, let us have due reverence for the Holy Father's preferred commentary on the whole Bible. This is authoritative. Uh, I'm joking, by the way, and 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 actually, magisterial authority will be something we'll talk about in this interview. But in any case, in any case. Um, okay. Here we, oh, <laughs> yep. Exactly what I thought. Yeah. Here we go. Paul's thought is broken by the intrusion of, uh, chapter 40, chapter 14, verse 33 B to 36 about women being silent in the assembly. The subordination of women in 1434 to 36 is not in keeping with Paul's egalitarian view of wives and husbands in seven, one to 11. 
Also, there is a natural ending to Paul's thought in 1433a, completing what he says from verse 26. Therefore, many commentators see this part of the chapter as a non-Pauline interpolation influenced by the subordination of wives to their husbands in the Deutero-Pauline letters. No, the, 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 the Deutero-Pauline letters, e.g. Ephesians 5.22 and Colossians 3.18. <laughs> beautiful. Absolutely beautiful, boys and girls. Oh, my word. Oh, my word. Yeah, that's funny. That's funny, Brody. We're not going to have comments like that. Thoughts on Pastor Katie and all inclusive Anglican Church of Sink <laughs> Woke Loose. <laughs> uh, first of all, it's Pastrix for you. Thank you very much. Second of all, um, she uh, she absolutely has every right to be where she is and doing what she is if she wants the hellfire. Kevin Day says, the Vaticanus distigmi oboloi argument in this passage is actually stronger than I thought when combined with D moving it, but I can't bring myself to say all manuscripts are wrong. Yeah, I actually I actually kind of took a little bit of an autistic time researching into that myself. Um, but some of the key research I found with it is that, <clears throat> um, A, considering that with text critical apparatuses like uh, apparati, if you will, like Nestle Allend, they they te- they they are meant to be a somewhat comprehensive thing of text critical um, variance locations, and so you can find them on virtually every single page. Um, and so the idea that oh look, there's there's a there's a mark here at this passage right where there is assumed to be um, what should we call it. Uh, right, right where Nestle Island also uh, happens. Sorry, there's a mark on this page of Vaticanus, right where the Nestle Island points to where there may be a variant. Um, oh, look, therefore Vaticanus recognizes a variant. Um, no, no, that's not a massive coincidence. Uh, additionally, some of the other, some other good research I saw, I forgot the names of the guys who did it, but basically they actually looked, uh, they actually looked, zoomed in at the ph- photography of the uh, different markings because. Philip Payne's argument basically relied on being able to distinguish between one dash and like a slightly longer dash. And that one of them, um, which first Corinthians 14, 34 to 36 had was specifically a text critical mark. And the problem is the, 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 by the naked eye, the difference in distance was non-existent. Um, and, uh, and, and so that just couldn't be used as a, like, Oh, look, this is especially text critical mark. Um, but yeah, ultimately, um, ultimately look, it's, it's, the way the debate is so artificially uh, hamstrung into just that, into just Codex Vaticanus, that kind of highlights the whole problem um, with the tech, with massive problem with the text critical field. Like it doesn't ma- honestly, Vaticanus, Vaticanus cannot have the passage there, or it can have a, it can have a recipe for Borsch, or it doesn't, it doesn't matter because in the end, as you say, the, every single other manuscript has it. Oh, look who's finally decides to join us! How are you, my man? I'm like 14 minutes late. Yeah, very late, big boy. What's uh? So I uh, see so you have uh, other other priorities. I uh, I thought you were my friend, Christian. I had to I had to refute Mark of Ephesus. Um, you mean Pastor Jim? Yeah, I mean Mark of Ephesus has seems to have the same historical knowledge as Pastor Jim. So like infallible and all encompassing. So true, King. So oh true. man. Ah, I've been working on this stream for so long. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, finally, we've got you here. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this is Christian Wagner here. And as I already said before, we're going to be discussing myths about the Roman church, about what it believes, um, and to some extent what it practices for the sake of, and to quote uh to quote the eminent Chinese general Sun Tzu. If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. So <laughs> that's my perspective coming at it um, as a non-Romish man myself. But ultimately, for all sides, including perhaps other um, other Roman Christians who uh, who don't have a full orbed view uh, of their own communion, as Christian Wagner can probably attest to in some of his interactions with people. So we are here, and uh, Christian, how are you now that you've uh, finally finished uh, sticking me up? Uh, <laughs> I'm doing good. I've been just so, I, I, I think I, I kind of want to just turn off Twitter for like a week and not hear or say the word filioque for a week. Oh, besides the creed, of course. 
Um, maybe I'll go to like an Eastern Catholic church on Sunday just so I don't have to say Filioque for one week. I'm joking. But yeah, it's just been a lot of, lot. you know how debate prep is and you know how intense I am. So you can imagine how intense my debate prep has been for this one. So yeah, it's taken yeah. a lot out of me, um, but glad yeah. to kind of have it over with. And I, I, at least I've heard, I've heard from other people that they thought my performance was good. Uh, they thought that it was uh, a sort of model of good uh, debate uh, yeah. between us. Uh, so, you know, I'm I'm happy with how it went. I'm just very unhappy agree. with that. Uh, that uh, how do I say this nicely? That man, Jay Dyer, uh, gay crier. Um, and <laughs> me on my own streams versus me on Paul's streams. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very, I'm very unhappy with him. Very unhappy. Uh, he, he seems to, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm an in defense of, of Jay. He seems like a very nice guy in private. Um, I, I, I genuinely think that he's probably a, uh, a nice guy at heart, but he just has something that's just like an insatiable urge to just crap on everything. Yeah, it's because you keep uh, promoting the uh, the forgery or interpolation in Basel. Yeah, it's he. And then I I was trying to have a nice like dinner with uh, kind of I was watching Bluey. You know what Bluey is yes. the Australian kids yes. show. Yeah, that's where I know about all of the uh, Australian terms now, the Dunny and uh, and stuff like that. Yeah, the one the ones that the like the backwater ones that leak out the side of the continent. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> I was I was chilling watching Bluey with my kids, and then and then I get Twitter messages from this guy like, "Oh, do you want to debate epistemology? Oh, are you a textual scholar?" And I was like, "Dude, I'm trying to like hang out with my family. What are you? I, I what are you doing, Jay? Yeah. So um, I, I don't. Apparently, no news for me. Yeah, uh, no news at all. And Sorry, man. I, I'm kind of tired of it at this point." Like I have had good fun. interactions with Ubi. I've had good uh, interactions with David Erhan. Like people I wouldn't expect to have good interactions with. They're just normal guys uh, who, if you're yeah. if you're respectful to them, they'll be respectful to you. But Jay, everything he touches turns toxic, and yeah. kind of kind of just done with him at this point. Unfortunately, it seems like that. And as as you said, he does seem at like a decent bloke, at least in private. And I've even watched a number of his streams and debates where he otherwise is decent, at least for the most part. Um, but I did, I have to concur with your look at that debate. I was also very surprised at how good and cordial it was. And you definitely did an excellent job. One of my, easily my favorite moment is when it started up and, uh, David Erhan, he asked, are we live? Are we live? And then when you, uh, and then when my second favorite bit is right after that, when you said, this is the face of demonic possession. <laughs> I need to find that. I need to find that video. <laughs> oh man, nineteen minutes in, and we haven't even touched the main thing. How good! This is a classic Paul uh, Facey moment. David Erhan, uh, Diamond Brothers. It was see that guys. That was a rare glimpse of uh, Wagner accessing the noose live. Yeah, that was. And David. Whoa, your mic's gone to crap. Oh, it has. Trump. Yeah, just for the past, like the last thing you said. Okay, you're good now. Is that good? Okay, blowtorch. Yeah, so if you're watching, David, this isn't meant to make fun of you. This is meant to be funny. Yeah. I'm alive right now. <laughs> Did you see that? <laughs> Let's play that again. Are we live? Are we live right now? He's clearly making demonic faces. <laughs> There's no question about it. That's the face of anti-Catholicism. <laughs> it's obvious that a demon is animating him. <laughs> Peter Diamond. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Peter, Peter oh my Diamond word. is just um, so, okay. so, um, so. That was that was from the James Oy video. That's where that that's was. Yeah, it was that was freaking gold. Oh my word. Um, okay, last thing before we start. So I noticed you got the uh, you got the buzz cut going now. When did you join the skinheads? Um, no comment. No, my uh, okay. So what happened is my wife usually cuts my hair, and she absolutely butchered it this time. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
hand or just race not. <laughs> yeah, so I told her, I'm like, give me the buzz cut. And then she gave me the buzz cut. And I was like, yeah, I kind of like it. It's functional. Um, yeah, it's functional, I guess, is the best thing I like about it. Honestly, I envy you I that, that was like... your mistake because getting a haircut, like a top haircut botched and having to restart is much more tolerable. And as you said, it's functional than in my case, when your dad absolutely botches a beard trim and you have to shave the whole thing off. How about um, my, when your dad absolutely resets. botches? How about when your dad absolutely botches the genetics for your uh, hair? <laughs> why you? Why you talk about yourself like that? <laughs> oh, what are you talking about? My hairline's <laughs> fine, bro. My hair's fine, bro. Look at that. Look at that. It's fine, bro. No, no, yeah, it's true. My dad's side is uh, is not the best with hair genetics, but I think that's actually in divine providence because I will eventually get the Ahmed cut. Just oh, really Max the Confessor, were you the one who said hey. that this was? Did you were you the one who said that the debate was quote demoralizing for the Eastern Orthodox? <laughs> I saw somebody say that, and I was like, oh my gosh, that was they must have thought very little of me. <laughs> true, so true um but in any case thank you so much max the confessor for that uh, 5.99 thing and since that came up uh first and i can't really tag a super chat until it's gone which is awkward because then i have to go back and find it might as well address that first so again summary of what's happening we're going through major myths and even lesser known myths um lesser known in the sense that more people believe that's actually true when it's actually not uh about roman catholicism about the roman church so um how wagner uh, let's go with the first myth, I reckon. You know what? Let's start with that one. Why are Roman Catholics, Aryans, semi civilians atheists, and, and pagan Pachamama worshippers? Uh, we're Can't the answer good. It? We okay. are, we, no, no, no. We are all, we encompass all of the good that Aryans, semi civilians atheists, and pagan Pachamama worshippers uh, have and negate all of the evil that is present. All right. Someone that clip that and cut out the bit when he says negate. <laughs> Someone put that, please. Thank you very much. And put it up. <laughs> Paul will look like Salah from Indiana Jones soon. That is the aesthetic, boys. That is the vibe. And or, or if you will, just a straight up uh, Arabic sand monkey uh, Gimli. Just that's my that's my that's my vibe right there. Because I'm like I'm like what are you again? Like you're like six something, are you in height? Uh, six foot two, I think. I'm five nine. Uh, shrimp. <laughs> Boulder. Yeah, no, I'm, as in I'm the boulder. Like I'm actually, you know, I've got that dense strength in my muscles. Okay, so let's go with the actual first myth. So on the authority of tradition versus the Bible in the Roman religion. So um, you have heard that it is said that in Rome, the Bible takes a back seat and it's not important. It's not authoritative. It's all about the tradition and whatever the Pope says. Mm -hmm. but you say to us mr wagner yeah so this is it, it's always an interesting conversation uh especially with protestants who have kind of grown up in the general uh like view of the medieval church as or at least the dark ages as uh oppressive in some way you know it, and then you get the sort of like hagiographical sort of uh, you had Whitcliffe do this and you had a huss want to give the bible to the plowboy and to blah, blah 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 and you, you get all you get all that no it wasn't huss it was the other guy i can't even remember the guy's names anymore well which was, was the english one the english uh Wycliffe height who translated the bible yes Wycliffe. no no there's the his followers oh. his follower oh. Wycliffe's follower cliffites dang. Um, yeah with cliffites Dang, he doesn't know fake props. But basically, you get you get this massive. I'm an Anglican. Narrative. I'm not Cliffite. <laughs> Wait, Cliff. You get this massive narrative, uh, in in the sort of common milieu. And this is something that even like seculars who go to American public schools are going to kind of have a broad awareness of. But unfortunately, I would I, I must tell you that this is false. When it when it comes to the access to sacred scripture this was something that had been exhorted to for centuries uh, before the reformation uh, the church thought that sacred scripture and its reading and prayer was something which was very important for the laity and uh, really the where the restrictions do come in 
are in certain special circumstances. So there's multiple circumstances in which the church placed restrictions on the reading of scripture. So the most common circumstance would be somebody who somebody who couldn't properly read sacred scripture without getting themselves into trouble. So this would be somebody who was spiritually or intellectually immature. I guess intellectually is not uh, the best way of putting it, but doctrinally immature. That they didn't know the teaching um, of the scripts, the teaching of revelation. I'll put that in a more broad way. The teaching of revelation in a uh, general way. So they could go to, I don't know, pick up Leviticus and read Leviticus and then just absolutely freaking ruined like it ruined their entire view of religion uh, just by doing <laughs> like that so uh people were allowed to read scripture uh with the permission of their confessor um and with uh, yeah really with the permission of their confessor they would have some sort of spiritual director that would um aid them in the reading of scripture but for people who were illiterate you know kind of i guess didn't apply this was more for literate people who had spirit uh, who had spiritual directors and such mm -hmm. so yeah the the church wasn't really um against the reading of scripture uh per se um just in certain circumstances where they mm -hmm. thought that it was pastorally necessary to say hey maybe you should be you know mm -hmm. reading uh this catechism because this catechism is going to help you where you're at right now and on the official level, on like the level of defining doctrine, dogma and what have you, um, mm -hmm. with the, the idea, the same idea as, well, the Bible takes a back seat and it doesn't really matter a lot. Is that true or is that a myth as well? So that that's also a myth. Um, <clears throat> so when it comes to sacred scripture, sacred scripture above any other written document, I'll put it like written document, it, it is completely unique in the fact that not only is it something which is which reveals certain mysteries but it's something which is inspired and what i what i mean by that distinction is if i recited to you the nicene creed or the apostles creed or the athanasian creed or or any a very dogmatic church teaching that we would all uh, agree on if i recited that to you you would say that i am reciting to you revealed mysteries but I am not reciting to you the very words of God as inspired in that way. Mm -hmm. So we talk about the, the teaching of the church. We would say it's something which is protected from error. So it's not the, not the very words of God, it's something which is merely protected from error. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the sacred scriptures, it is the word of God, which is why doctrinally, um, uh, what was... What was the uh, the the church state? I can't remember the church statement with this specifically said. But basically, the idea is that uh, when it comes to dogmatic proofs, uh, scripture takes takes priority. The direct text Jesus of scripture takes priority. Not uh, that's not doctor. Pro that's not Providentismus Deus, is it? Or it might no. be Providentismus Deus. Wow, I know your religion um, better than you. How about that? <laughs> No, you just you just know the Bible better than me. You know all about the Bible stuff. That's true. Insofar That's as true. it, insofar as Providentissimus Deus uh, connects to the Bible, you know better than me because it's it's stronger on that side. Hey, hey. but yeah, um, because because the scriptures are the very word of God, both doctrinally, so in dogmatic proofs, and in the devotional life of the Christian, it takes a pride of place over any other book because it's the the very word of God rather than. Um, the very good words of man, I guess you could say. Too easy. And what sources would you recommend for people in reading up on what you basically just said? Um, so De Werboom, um, from the Second Vatican Council. Uh, it's very, very, very good. So um, it, this was this is kind of the um, uh, it's not that it's actually not that long. It's a lot shorter than I thought. But uh, for example, it says uh, um, sacred theology rests on the written word of God as its primary and perpetual foundation. It says together with sacred tradition, but it's saying uh, sacred tradition um, is something which is alongside uh, sacred scripture as um, central. And basically, like this whole, this actually, this whole paragraph basically just says what I said. 
<clears throat> um, but yeah, in in day wear, boom, uh, especially in chapter six, which he has to use the proper pronunciation, day wear, boom, day wear, boom, especially in chapter six, which is sacred scripture in the life of the church. Uh, it talks about the Catholic view and use of, of sacred scripture uh, versus something mm -hmm. like tradition. And also there was the, uh, let me see, there's a second church document, which I think is very, very important in light of um, what some liars will say, well, Roman Catholic liars will say about um, our view of the, oh, where is it? Um our view of the sacred scriptures so the uh, i'm retarded <laughs> and all the people I, I can't yeah. <laughs> i can't find can't find what i'm looking for so i'm just saying uh, 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 uh. so there was the the synod on the word which uh, if you don't know in the roman catholic church there's <clears throat> synods Mm -hmm. every three years uh this was the 12th ordinary general assembly the word of god in the life of the church so what is very fun is we had a whole synod talking about sacred scripture and why it's great back in 2008 and what's super super cool is that there were a bunch of bishops this is like a this is an epic um story there were a bunch of european bishops that tried to argue that one day, Wetterboom uh, says that all of those truths necessary for salvation have been revealed to us. It means in scripture, only the truths necessary for salvation are infallible. And a bunch of uh, like bishops stood up and said, hey, that's not what the text says. And that started is. like st basically started like jeering at him and stuff. Was that was that was that like a bunch of libtards who tried to argue that? Yeah, it was it was a yeah. bunch of flip tards. But what You're ended up people behind the Jerome biblical commentary, let's be yeah. real. <laughs> yeah, but what, what's really cool is there was actually a um uh post synodal apostolic exhortation. I'm trying to get it, but it yeah, was either please. Benedict or Francis. Um, they issued a one of these exhortations and just absolutely like slammed these guys and they had a whole I, I the think, cdf wrote a whole document about this oh yeah they slammed these bishops for trying I to think say that that might have been um that actually might have been francis because again a fu funny thing because i was reading the intro to this jerome biblical commentary this 20, 2022 edition and it specifically spoke about um how francis he created a special day for like the word of god and oh the, the word of god sunday yes yeah, Word of God Sunday, um, and I think there was some meeting about it about, about the the Bible too. Um, so I'm, I'm suspecting it might have been him. Well, okay, so I I found it. It's um it is Benedict the Sixteenth. This was okay. right before he retired. But it's Verbum Domini, Verbum Domini. Oh, okay, Verbum. Is that so? That's the document. Mm -hmm. Yeah, verbum, very, you mean very, very Domini. Good. Hmm? You mean Verbum Domini? Verbum Domini. That's what I said. The night. Okay, I thought you said Dominum because the, no. I guess the mic was a bit um. Oof, thank God you didn't uh, botch your Latin live on. Uh... I know that would be very embarrassing. All right, sweet. So I'm gonna put that too. Verbum Domini Benedict. It's super, super long. Like, I, like I swear, that. after after the after Vatican One, papal encyclicals just go like like they used to be. You know, like five pages maybe. And afterwards, it's like okay, let me drop this like 300 page banger. Uh, papal encyclical real quick hold up does it does this just straight up include Werbum day or is that just the name of the subchapter no no it's it's an interpret it's uh, it interprets um okay yeah Too interprets easy. well that's it. useful thank you for i actually hadn't heard of that myself so thank you very much for that yeah then there's also a cdf document as well um now it's called the ddf the <laughs> dicastery for the doctrine of the faith um which talks about infallibility um now i can't find it right now but uh that should be sufficient for everybody yeah cdf uh it, it came up but basically the the church has actually been very uh thank you evan uh the church has been very strong in her defense of the infallibility of scripture um mm -hmm. which is really weird because it seems like almost all of our theologians um have really weird views of inspiration which to be fair I, I find personally that 
uh, the theology of inspiration is very, very, very difficult with how you articulate the specific relationship between the God and uh, God revealing or God inspiring and the one inspired and how um, like try not not falling into those errors around um, to uh, basically making certain words in scripture human, but also not falling into the opposed error of some sort of like mechanical dictation of scripture. Got it. Got it. Makes sense. Um, related and the next topic uh, or next myth is um, something which uh, you and I have both gone together in combating quite a bit, um, precisely because uh, precisely because you also see this as a bit of a scourge uh, within at least the online sphere, the online Gen Z sphere of your uh, of your community. That being the idea that um, in the Roman Church or just in general, from a Roman perspective, uh, you cannot have certainty on the interpretation of scripture or um, an interpretation of scripture is not authoritative unless you have the church officially promulgating it. Is this, are either of those propositions true? Well, the second one's more, I guess you could say more true than the first one, but still not true. Yeah, more more true than the first one, but it's still not true at all. Mm -hmm. Uh, So the church has said, uh, officially in Provententissimus Deus, uh, it has said that we can, through scientific methods, and by scientific it doesn't mean like science, it means through the uh, method of hermeneutics, which is the uh, systematic study of how to read a text and mm-hmm. arrive at an interpretation through context, through cultural background, and, and so on and so forth. But I'm sure you guys know about that already. Uh, so Bubble the man, church why. has said that we can... Uh, through that means come to the Catholic interpretation of scripture uh, and of various texts. So uh, that that is, uh, on, on that part, yes, uh, individuals can read scripture, can certainly come to certain interpretations of scripture and ought to read scripture. And it actually kind of makes me uh, a bit upset about some of the Catholics pushing this um, uh, epistemic nihilism when it comes to the reading of scripture. And the issue is, is that I've met people uh, and very frequently um, who are scared of reading scripture because they don't want to become a heretic, which is just, I, I, I mean, I, I get where I get where they're getting uh, because of the type of rhetoric that's launched by a lot of these Catholic yeah. apologists. But it just I don't get how you could uh, genuinely think that reading the word of God is going to somehow harm you any more than reading church documents is going to harm you. Unless of course you secretly think that scripture doesn't teach the Catholic faith. Then, then I can see. <laughs> but I think there might be a little bit of that going on. Roro raggy indeed. Yeah. I, I kind of get those underlying feelings too. I remember um, looking at one guy where he straight up, it was one of the guys online where, the, the, the one guy that we're both debating on Twitter on this issue and like his modus operandi was every time you reply to him, he just responds with, no, no, you don't understand my argument. And then the one time where you replied to him with his own words and he's like, no, that's not my argument. <laughs> oh man. So, oh yeah. I know. I know the guy you're talking yeah, about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was, and I just remember him basically saying, look, if, if, if the Catholic church isn't true, then I'm going to basically become like a pagan or whatever, you know, like nothing else will work. And, so I basically just I straight up reply to him. Oh, okay. So the 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 witness of the resurrection isn't enough for you. So just straight up, where is your well, faith actually there, rooted? I, I think there's I think there's a sense in which Roman Catholics kind of have to say that because uh, from from the consideration of the motives of credibility, we're going to say that we can uh, know certainly that God has stamped. Uh, his approval upon the Holy Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church, especially through the witnesses of so many prophecies and miracles. So if if somehow the Roman Catholic faith becomes falsified, then God has witnessed a falsehood, which is just uh, obviously a you might as well like being a pagan wouldn't even be you you should just become a nihilist honestly you should just kill yourself at that <laughs> point um, <laughs> well i mean uh, i mean I, I, okay i'm not i'm not i'm not telling you guys you should don't clip that, that. Someone clip <laughs> Somebody that. Don't. but uh but seriously it's uh you, you really have to <clears> know like if you're going to live uh, why would anybody want to live in a world where god is witnessing the falsehood um so i do get that sentiment um but not probably not the same way in which uh, he actually meant it 
Yeah, even if I was um even even if I was Romanist myself, I'd probably still disagree and just say, look, you need to take intellectual humility and maybe reconsider whether you did have that certainty in the Roman Church, but that's obviously a debate for another time. Oh yeah, this is um, the subjective consideration, of course. So uh, exactly, yeah, <laughs> like exactly. <clears throat> um, but in any case, uh, thank you for that. We got that covered. Now we move on to common ideas um, that oh look, whatever the Pope says, you guys just followed it. Hey, look, guys, your Pope said uh, an, an an atheist kid's dad is going to heaven. Oh, therefore, uh, freaking magisterial contradiction. Or hey, ex papal statement from like an airplane or in the Pope Mobile or whatever, therefore magisterial contradiction. Um, is this true? Are all statements by popes equal? Okay, so there's <laughs> there's a lot of fun stuff with this because this has this all right, so copium. Thank you for confirming. Oh that. yeah, a lot of a lot of copium with this. <laughs> so there's there's actually a kind of two opposed camps. So you have like the where Peter is. Have you ever heard of the where Peter is people? Yes. Oh my gosh, I I uh, I despise the where Peter is uh, website. They had a they had an article talking about how um, Saint Maximilian Kolbe. Do you know who Maximilian Kolbe is? Yes, saying that he was anti-Semitic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wish I was making this stuff up. You could literally As die. Know, you could literally skin, you could literally <laughs> die in the Holocaust. And still be anti-Semitic. <laughs> okay, but uh, besides that, so there's the uh, there's the where Peter is crowd that basically says, um, like, yeah, Pope Francis uh, tweeted this morning. Uh, make sure you memorize that as part of your scripture memory. Um, and then there's the other crowd, which is basically like, you know, unless Pope Francis, you know, uh, tiptoes eight steps and then twirls around and stands on his index finger for 3.5 seconds and then don't, don't uh, forget says yeah. Simon says and then says Simon says then uh, it's not authoritative so uh, as many things um, between those two opposed errors there we can find the actual truth of the matter the so on the one hand the Pope the Pope only is authoritative as Pope and I think that's a very important consideration. So certain statements, we can say that Pope Francis actually wasn't speaking at Pope, as Pope. So, for example, um, the drawn biblical commentary that you have, the foreword by Pope Clearly Francis. Magisterial. Yeah, we we don't we don't read we don't read the forewords of texts or the um, like uh, private. Uh, actually, some this was something Benedict the Sixteenth was very good with. Is Benedict the Sixteenth was able to uh, still as Pope write books as a theologian because benedict the 16th was a theologian and he said hey i'm writing this as joseph ratzinger i'm not writing this as pope benedict the 16th uh so on on, on that side um we can distinguish between the private teaching of the pope and then his, him teaching as pope said contra said contra the heading of the foreword says the holy see no oh, oh that's a good point that's a good point actually is a good point eh? No, so they uh, he he puts his he puts his mark. Try to uh, sub distinguish your way out of that. Yeah, I'm sub distinguishing my way out of it. Yeah, he's not signifying that he is uh, teaching this forward to a book as Pope. Um, rather, that's just a normal uh, heading. As a mm. as like if you were the King of England and you were sending a private letter, you would probably put your King of England stamp um, on there. I can't remember Calder. Uh, you remember Calder? Uh, what what is it called? Um, the the sort of study of your like crests and, and stuff like that. It's his papal shield uh, that he's kind of like stamped. It would be like putting a, a a signet ring thing on there. Yeah, so he's, that's not him saying that he's teaching his pope. Right. In the so so here's a letter from the King of England. I'm not talking as the King of England. Okay, no, no, <laughs> no, no. I mean, I mean, I mean yeah, it's, it's 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 a it's an epinoetic um, to to use a. Uh, okay, orthodox. orthodoxism. It's an epinoetic <laughs> uh, distinction, of course. Sure, sure. Um, but, but yeah, yeah when, when you read when you read Pope Benedict's books, uh, <clears throat> it says Pope Benedict on the front. It says <clears throat> Pope Benedict the Sixteenth on the front. <clears throat> um, for as as another example of that. Um, so yeah, there, there's a difference between private teaching and then teaching as Pope. Uh, <clears throat> things like in, uh, airplane interviews uh, would also go into this, but things that would not go into this. This is very important would be papal homilies. So uh, when he preaches certain sermons. So for example, John the 22nd, when he uh, had the heretical proposition about the beatific vision, 
uh, he thought that the beatific vision uh, did not occur until uh, way af until after the resurrection rather than immediately upon death. Uh, that was uh, an erroneous proposition. I don't think it was heretical at that point. Uh, so he erred in his teaching magisterium. Mm. Um, and this was corrected under <clears throat> Benedict the 12th. <clears throat> uh, Benedict Deus is the encyclical. Whoever wrote Benedict Deus. Um, Benedict the 12th. Oh, Benedict the 12th. Wow, I am amazing. Um, so it was Benedict the 12th who corrected John the 22nd in John the 22nd's magisterium. So that, that kind of gets you the question like, okay, well, the Pope is teaching in his public magisterium. He's actually teaching something which is materially heretical. So what's going on here? So we also have um, a distinction between definitive and non definitive magisterial statements. So the Pope can teach uh, with different types of weights, uh, which I, I think this is kind of intuitive. So I, I will actually give you like an apostolic example. Mm -hmm. So when St. Peter wrote his first epistle versus when St. Peter was giving private spiritual counsel versus when St. Peter was giving a homily at his uh, at whatever parish he was at, he's going to be teaching with different degrees of authority. And according to at least Roman Catholics, he's going to be teaching with different <clears throat> degrees of safety. Um, I think actually the, 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 I think actually the better example to appeal to um and, and it's, it's 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 better because it's even both within sacred scripture is both um like with the apostle Paul he's preaching as an apostle the doctrine of the faith which is basically the vast majority of all his letters uh versus a particular instance like 1 Corinthians 7 where he's giving practical advice with mm -hmm. respect to I advise everyone uh if you're married be as if you're unmarried and so on and so forth because of the coming crisis and, and he explicitly says, not the Lord, I, but not the Lord. Um, yeah. And it's specifically on as a, it's specifically from his place as like, look, I'm concerned for you guys, mm -hmm. but everyone has their own gift from God. So I yeah, think there, a, there's, there is a, there is a sense in which some Roman Catholics are going to present this as like the sort of Simon says uh, type thing <laughs> uh, where, where it's like, oh, well, you didn't say the, didn't say the magic word and something like that. But there, there is a, there is a sense in which I think we can all agree that it makes sense to distinguish between various grades of teaching, which are going to have various grades of safety. If you believe in that sort of thing, like a, uh, a mm -hmm. safety from the Holy Spirit to the teachings of an individual, uh, such as the mm -hmm. Roman Pontiff. So when when it comes to his definitive teachings, it would be um, like the the most famous example would be like an ex cathedra teaching, uh, yes, which is we would say mm -hmm. is infallible uh, because he's teaching uh, as pope to the entire church uh, in virtue of his uh, office, and then binding on faith. Yeah. So uh, that would be the the super 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 high. But then anything from that all the way down to homilies. And what, uh, what you guys probably don't know is there's also certain degrees of safety and magisterial authority that bishops' conferences are going to have, that individual bishops are going to have, that even in some cases we can speak about certain non-Episcopal theologians having. Um, so there's a lot of different degrees and variations of magisterial authority. Um, but generally speaking, uh, bigger mean more authoritative but ultimately, um, ultimately, uh, we, we don't have any sort of specific um, gotcha moment uh, when <clears> it comes <throat> to, you know, the, the Pope saying bad thing. I guess you okay. Say. And what are some good sources you recommend to people on these distinctions between different uh, degrees of papal authority? Uh, I think the I think the the um, the one that everybody kind of wants to know about is the question of dissent um how about generally to start with like generally the nature of distinctions in papal authority uh, trying to think off the top of my head there's a few canons in the code of canon law that i can't remember lumen gentium um lumen gentium kind of um I was more so thinking of, uh, I can't think of it right now. The case for Catholicism by Trent Horn. The case for Catholicism. Actually, you know, uh, now that you speak about yeah. Jimmy Aiken's teaching with authority, uh, unironically. I heard you or someone else recommend that. Yeah, yeah. Jimmy Aiken's teaching with authority. All okay, right. I couldn't think of an official um, uh, ecclesiastical document, but 
I honestly don't think it's terribly bad, although he is he is um, wrong on some points of uh, this is called De Lochis, but he is wrong on um, like how he views the consensus of the fathers and such. But that's a story for a different day. It's good on like papal stuff. City of the Immaculata recommends arts fundamentals in the intro. Oh. I'm not a fan of a hot, but yeah. I know. So, yeah. so do you do you recommend Aiken or not, or qualified or? Um, I would I, I would say it's a it's a his teaching with authority is a good book. Um, okay, it's it's good it's good for the the people that wouldn't want to like go and read like the STS or something like that. Because if if I had my dream and every single Protestant could read a book on like papal authority and so it would be the STS. Uh, but I know, I know. If I recommend it, nobody's going to read it. What, what actually? What is the uh, S- Sacred S- Theologiae Summa? I remember that. Yeah, that, yeah. that big one. Also, mm-hmm. I might as well recommend that. Why not? <laughs> Recommended. It's in English, guys. So brains. Yeah, I got, I got the PDFs. Um, uh, sac, sacra. Where is it? Sacri? A A E. Yeah. Okay, sacra Theologiae Summa. Oh, brutal. <clears throat> All right, there we go. So, thank yeah, you. Yeah, but that, what's man. what's important is um so to I guess clarify a certain point mm-hmm. um is I'm sure a lot of you Protestants have been hearing some buzz in the Roman Catholic world about uh what's called infallible safety. Um so whether a pope in his non-definitive teachings um what type of notes he may be liable to and by notes uh, we mean condemned propositions whether the Pope in his non-definitive teaching can teach condemned propositions or not, and so on and so forth. Um, but that's not really a settled matter. Um, mm-hmm. That's really something that, uh, to my knowledge, uh, was uh, started to be discussed a lot more in the 19th century uh, explicitly, right. although some are going to say, well, implicitly before it talks about this. But. Right. Well, someone says teaching with authority is the modern-day summa. Can you confirm? Um, whatever your answer, I'm going to personally tell Jimmy Aiken. I can't confirm because it's wrong. <laughs> I don't yeah. know the the memeing the memeing can only go so far. <clears throat> I can't I can't uh, I can't joke around about Jimmy Aiken being the new Thomas Aquinas like uh, what's his name said Matt Fred. <laughs> <sighs> oh man! I mean, look. Okay. That's not that's not me slighting at Aiken, but if someone was to say that about me, I'd la- I'd laugh just as hard. <laughs> I expect Christian to laugh as hard at that too. But quick interlude before we continue. I should have done this at the beginning, but a thank you to my legendary supporters on my brand new locals, and thank you, including uh, also to my uh, recent third supporter, another Timothy. If you legends want awesome benefits uh, for supporting me, such as private live streams, private uh, study notes. Um, uh, depending on the tier, also if you're at the highest tier, uh, private uh, private meetups regularly, as well as priority in your Q and A questions, such as in this stream, become a supporter on my locals today. You absolute legends! Thank you for those who are currently supporting me to help me turn this into a job. Anyway, continuing on with what we're doing now, um, and also if you're a, if you're a supporter of Christian Wagner, just come over to my locals instead. It's actually kind of cool here. In any case, locals. I've never tried locals. What uh, is is locals it, pretty good? It is pretty good. Um, it's it's got the stability of uh, Patreon. It doesn't have the the autistic random errors of subscribe star that I, I got a lot. Um, it's it, it's a different system. Like you can't just create a bunch of custom tiers or whatever. But uh, you, you kind of only have two of them. But you can set the the prices for them. But I gave a workaround where in the public post that anyone can see, I kind of said, hey, if you give this much to this much. You get these benefits and, and so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, it is actually really good. It's pretty much an all-in-one system, kind of like hosting a. It's kind. It's kind of like hosting a um, like a, a, a like a Facebook group, but on locals, and you can give different tiers to people, and they get different benefits within it. So it it works pretty well. Um, mm. In any case, with that said, now <clears throat> let's move on to the veneration of Mary and the saints, uh-huh. Wagner. Uh, I I, you have heard Mary. you have heard that it was said that in Rome you guys worship Mary and the Saints. But what do you say? Uh yeah, we worship Mary and the Saints. Someone clip that, please. No <laughs> more context. <laughs> okay, so we 
Uh, I, I think a fair question um, that we ask is we don't really make the the religious civil distinction that is commonly made within Protestant theology. So <clears throat> rather we would merely, and we, we think this works on better, theo- uh, better philosophical grounds, but we would merely distinguish uh, certain acts based on their formal objects. Um, how do I explain that in layman's terms? Basically, if uh, you intend to give some sort of honor without essentially altering circumstances, then uh, that applies for all of those cases. Um, so we would say is uh, like giving a kiss, for example. That's that's a good example. Uh, kiss icons. I'm not really an icon kisser because that's more of like an Eastern Catholic thing. But you know. I'm not I'm not uh, Byzantium's finest, the anti-Protestant goon squad, Michael Lofton. Uh, type but um uh <laughs> speaking of which ladies and gentlemen prepare for my response anglican jihadists anyway go on oh man uh I, you can't do that man <laughs> oh man you can't do that uh you 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 definitely you're definitely not going to be able to fly to america anytime soon so yeah with uh with <laughs> said I come like, acts, like kissing kissing is an example kissing is meant to give some sort of um mm honor or some sort of uh, expression of affection. So we would say without any uh, essentially altering circumstances. So no matter whether it's, you know, a loved one on earth, like I am kissing my beautiful daughter's cheek or uh, a, the icon of a saint who I also love in heaven, that there are no essentially uh, altering um circumstances in this moral act that would change the species of the act. Therefore, when we're asking about the difference between um, the type of, I'm just going to call it all worship, uh, just because, you know, the type of worship that is acceptable to God versus the type of only acceptable to God versus the type of worship you can give to God and um, creatures. So for example, I can sing a song to my wife. I can sing a song to God. And I can sing a song to St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, so when I'm asking myself, what what actually makes that sort of leap between things I can do to uh, God and creatures to give honor to them and things that I uh, only can do to God? Uh, what Roman Catholic theologians are going to say is um, that that act, which is only ordered towards God, is sacrifice because sacrifice uh, involves a acknowledgement of supreme dominion um, because you have some sort of outward sign that's being destroyed. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's kind of what, but yes, we, we do worship Mary. We do worship the saints. Um, I think the, the uh, Dolia Latria distinction as traditional as it is, uh, tends to obscure uh, exactly what we're uh, what we're trying to say. Mm-hmm. Um, we really would just say that there is worship which is acceptable for only God, and there's worship which uh, does not only stop at God. Where if yeah. you're speaking about the whole Latria Dulia distinction, it kind of misses the whole point of making the distinction, which is to say, hey, we do a lot of these um, we do a lot of these uh, actions also to creatures. Um, so yeah, that, that's at least my thing. So there is a, um, so, and that, uh, that's actually kind of the same route I've taken, uh, on my, like independently myself in doing my study on the nature of worship in the scriptures, where it's actually more useful to speak of worship as a univocal concept. Mm. Um, but then with the different sub uh, ideas within that. So of course, like, um, so like in the sense to make it all clear we do worship uh and even in a even in a uh, anglican or what have you framework um we do worship other people we worship kings we worship uh we worship magistrates and what have you we worship other people in authority above us the question is what do you mean by worship of course uh, there are certain um uh what you might call it um <clears throat> uh, dispositions of worship that are appropriate to such one to such persons but then there's also dispositions of worship appropriate to God. 
And so I think uh, I think that's a good way that you uh, you frame it with the with Rome's position too, um, to speak of worship first as a uni- as a as a unifical concept, but then distinguishing the kinds that can come out of that. So that does help a lot with uh, with dialogue. So in some people, uh, do Romanists worship Mary and the saints? Yes. yes. No more qualification. No, I'm kidding. Um, well, actually, actually, I think um, I think we can even even speak of uh, you. You guys is worshiping Mary and the saints as well, um, because I mean, even in actually certain Reformed traditions, you're going to have um, the sort of extolling of the virtues of the saints is still a, a mm. practice which is um, brought about. Mm. So I, I, I think it, it gets all messy, and then we have to just ask yeah. ourselves, okay, where. Where and on what basis is there a line which is drawn? Yes, uh, because everybody's going to agree that there is worship on both sides of the line. Uh, it's it's just a question of where we draw it. Uh, I think that's a much more helpful conversation to have. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. With with my body, I I worship thee. Yeah, the the BCP uh, holy matrimony right. Based, very based. I do indeed worship my wife. <laughs> you don't have a wife. <laughs> How do you know? I know. <laughs> no, you don't. Happy birthday, come in. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's in Palestine right now. Oh, okay, I was gonna, I was gonna make a seriously messed up joke, but I'm not. okay. Never mind. No. <laughs> oh, I'll private, I'll private chat to you. Uh- <laughs> yeah, because I heard, uh, I heard Lebanon is is kind of uh, now getting involved in it. Take private chat. (laughs) (laughs) That's so bad. (laughs) Oh, man. That is horrible, man. You can't say that. You can't say that. Oh man, you have you're gonna have to like I don't even know, like take cold showers for the next year in order to do penance for <laughs> That's so funny though. Well, what does that make you for laughing at it? I it was involuntary laughter. Oh, how convenient. Yeah, yeah. Concupiscence, blah de blah blah. Anyway. <laughs> Actually, uh Concupiscence does not um actually actually okay no. actually concupiscence does not remove yeah, yeah, culpability different, different from concept act. we're talking more like a it's reflex. only um it's only ignorance exactly so true. ignorance so true anyway so uh what resources would you recommend on uh, on that particular issue of worship of the saints and mary um i think actually bellarmine's uh as long as uh just gonna boo boo. Um, Bellarmine's uh, work on the cult of the saints. Let me see exactly what the title of this is. <clears throat> I'm not gonna be able to find it, am I? Or am I thinking about somebody else? I am thinking about somebody else. Dang, who am I thinking about? Oh, I think it was. Um, he writes about it in. Um, his work on the sacrifice of the mass. That's where he writes about it. When he's talking about like, the concept of sacrifice. Is it just called on the sacrifice of the mass or? Yeah, it's just called on the sacrifice of the mass. Yeah, uh, in the in the section when he's trying to figure out like, oh, what does sacrifice mean? Um, that's really helpful. On the most holy sacrifice of the mass. On the most holy sacrifice, the most, most... Holy sacrifice in that intersection on definition of sacrifice by Robert Bellarmine. A uh, city of the Immaculata says on the veneration of the saints. Is it called on the veneration of the saints? Let's 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 quickly fact check that, shall we? On the veneration of the saints book. Uh oh yep, on the canonization and veneration of the saints by Robert Bellarmine. Ah, I knew I wasn't making that up. I knew I wasn't making that up. You know, I I literally read something and I thought that I made it up. Thank you, City of the Immaculata. 
All right, excellent. I recommended that too. Okay. <clears throat> um, so next one, next issue after this. Um, Wagner, why are all your priests banned from getting married? That's bad. Paul spoke in First Timothy about uh, a good episcopos being the husband of one wife. What do you got to say? Why do you guys ban that? I'm deburnt. Destroyed. Annihilated. Okay, so <clears throat> the history of this is fun because this actually kind of trolls the Eastern Orthodox, which I like doing. So um and I'm just I'm just gonna go out and say it. So in the in the history of the church, we have never had anything but celibate clergy. Oh wow, that is very controversial of you, Mr. Wagner, right? No, we've had married clerics. So we've had um, clerics who got married and uh, would be ordained later in life, sending their wife off to a convent or uh, just taking some sort of vow of chastity. Um, and then at the around the uh, 7th century, uh, in the, especially in the, uh, the Council of Toledo, is Toledo? No, no. Expecting Wagner to know his sources, Pfft, please. I just make up stuff. Yeah. House of Trullo. How did I mix up Toledo and Trullo? <laughs> all of this, all this filioque stuff in my brain. The Council of Trullo. Um, there was quite an innovation that was put forward in the East that would, uh, because you can imagine uh, in the East when you're having married men who are become priests, married to their wives. Their wives don't get sent off to a convent. They live together and they take vows of chastity. You can imagine how uh, well that worked out. <laughs> uh, it didn't work out well at all. And a lot of um, babies were being born. So basically uh, what the what the East did at the Council of Trullo is they made the decision um, to allow for conjugal relations uh, between those priests who became priests while they were married. That is still the practice in the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, when it comes to the Latin church, Latin church for a very long time, uh, even up until 12th, 13th, 14th century, we're talking a very long time, had priests who were married. Um, and you did have many abuses, uh, as you see in St. Peter Damien's works in the 12th century, I think it was 12th century, um, where he, he go, oh, I wish I had some quotes about what he called clerics wives. <laughs> These were so oh yeah. Oh yeah. Let me, let me see if I can find one. He so he basically um, led the led the charge to um, call out these uh, clerical wives um, and clerical homosexuality uh, as well. Um, uh, While you're getting that, John Clarafi says, as discipline in the first millennium, only Nestorians had married bishops and sources I can recall. Okay, right. So the one so the one true church had married bishops. <laughs> you're so bad. I'm trying I'm trying to think of uh where I would find this. Ah, maybe maybe I'll find maybe I'll find a quote later. Um if you blabber on and on about something. But yeah, basically St. Peter Damien in the 12th century was, um, or was this 11th century? Wow. I literally just had the article open. 11th century. I'm brain dead. So in the 11th century, St. Peter, Peter, St. Peter Damien uh, fought the cleric's wives, called them prostitutes uh, and so on and so forth and told them to stop seducing your husbands um, and then kicked all the cleric's wives out uh, well, it was kind of a long process. It didn't happen right away, but yeah, he he kind of put the put the pin in it, uh, really, because they were supposed to be chaste. The wives and husbands obviously weren't chaste, and a lot of times these guys were not only um, having lawfully married wives; they were also getting concubines. And Peter Damien uh, destroyed a lot of it because he convinced a bunch of laymen to just go to different priest masses if their priests were acting badly. And if you don't have people at your mass, you don't get a mass stipend, so you don't get paid, so you start and die. Um, not really. They just stopped having, they just kicked their wives out or just went poor. Um, so that's the, that's kind of the history in the West uh, when it comes to that. 
so we, we went in two different directions. One was to soften the discipline. The other was to eliminate the, um, the, how do I put it? Eliminate the allowance that was being made. Um, but I think the, the better question is actually about conjugal relations uh, within uh, between priests and non-priests, whether priests were having kids or not is, I guess, the better question. I, I think that's neither apostolic nor patristic. Fair enough. So a, a wall of cope, basically. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A wall of cope. So I, I actually think that um, there were obviously married priests in uh, from the time of the apostles. I just don't think they were having conjugal relations with their wives. What do you anyway. have like a sword? Do you have a source or something? Do you have just like oh, actually, um, Bishop Shmanukius of uh, hey. Berlia, uh, he said hey. that a priest had hey, conjugal Wagner. relations with his wife. Wagner, it was revealed to me in a dream. Oh, okay, okay, I got it. Yeah, yeah, get destroyed, mate. I don't know. I, I think I just put an argument from prescription on you, where it's just like okay, when it, when they actually do start talking about this issue, priests weren't having conjugal relations with their wives, and when they were, they were in trouble. So that's I'll my argument. Put a, I'll put an argument from, well, my mum says you're wrong, so cry. That's true. And I'd also talk about the presupposition in First Timothy 3 about uh, husbands uh, taking care of their household writ large. Um, so not uh, bishops taking care of the household writ large. So not simply, oh, look, they have this one spouse. In any case, in any case, it's a debate to have at another time. And as you can see, I absolutely shocked the masculinity out of Wagner with that one statement. Peter Damien is a proto-Protestant. What are you talking uh, about? Yeah. He was a uh, cardinal of the Holy Roman Catholic Church. Hey, Just hence the term Peter. proto. Hence the word proto. <laughs> he fought against clerics being married. That was his whole life. How is he a proto-Protestant? He was just a very chaste Protestant. Hey, cry. A uh, few such cases. Many such cases. Well, well. Well, anyway, <laughs> okay. Now let's move on to the one that your that your brain is probably most acquainted with at this very moment, the filioque. Can I ask Specifically, about justification? huh? I can ask about justification. I will I, be. I guess soon. we can talk about the filioque and then justification. Yeah, sure, easy. Um, because because there, there is actually someone's question um that I starred from earlier, which is basically about uh, justification. Um, oh, by the way, there's a couple of a uh, couple of super chats I haven't gone through yet. Super sorry, Max Confessor. Michael Lewis one time did a weird Maoist struggle session with Catholic Sat. It was bizarre. I have no idea who these guys are, but do you, do you or probably just a bunch of cringe communists or whatever? I don't care, bro. I I, I tell you, I I really, 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 really don't care what any of these guys say. Fair enough. Thank you, Max Confessor, again for that super chat. And thank you for another super chat. If Roman Catholic Church is true, then why Borgia Black Magic Omerta Hermetic Mafia? <laughs> <laughs> Borgia, the Borgia Pope. Borgia, Borgia Popes, uh, I actually think that Alexander the Sixth. to be honest, I think Alexander the Sixth became a holy man when he became Pope. I, I think he was a scoundrel and bought the papacy and blah, 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 blah. But I think once he became Pope, it seems like from our contemporary sources that he actually cleaned up his act, was chased and, and so on and so forth. So, yeah. Fair enough. That's, so that's the Borgia part of it. Uh, black magic, uh, so on and so forth. Yeah, I'm, I'm done. There you go. There you go. So let's go to the filioque now, since that is most fresh in your mind right now. Specifically, not that Rome affirms, uh, affirms the filioque, um, but well, I guess uh, I guess there's kind of myths about precisely how. Let's really briefly, in summary, the the myth that's particularly common in ortho circles, the idea that there is a double procession from two principles mm. in the filioque. How do you how do you respond to that absolutely self evident fact? Well, secondly, Owens just calls it a single procession, single spiration. Um, when whenever Catholic sources use the word double. In, in any sense, they mean that the supposita is, is there's two uh, supposita, there's two persons which are involved in the procession. Like uh, this, this kind of annoys me. This is part of a long litany of just like fail freshman, freshman like logic class type 
mistakes that I see from like arguments that I see from some Eastern Orthodox about the filioque way. It's like, oh, um, the Catholic Encyclopedia uses the word uh, double procession. Um, and yeah, it doesn't matter what the dogmatic source is. Uh, the Catholic Encyclopedia uses it and clearly in context describes it as meaning that there's two supposita. And actually in their article in the Trinity talk about how it's one procession, one spiration. Uh, yeah, but it, it's it's like an easy polemical point to put on our slideshows. It's, it's like, come on. Uh, like stop these weird, weird cringe word games. Let's actually like, you know, talk about something interesting. Let's actually debate about something. But old, um, as like as a point of history, which is usually what's being asked here with the addition of the filioque, um, as many know, in the sixth century, the well, the filioque is a traditional phrase that goes back before even before the time of St. Augustine. Um, it's, it's a phrase used by the fathers and it becomes creedal in the, uh, qui cum que, uh, wult, which is, uh, more famously known as the Athanasian creed, which, uh, became a very popular, uh, canticle. It's not really creed, it's a canticle. It became a very popular canticle in the West. And this was also, um, added locally in the Nicene creed in some local councils, in order to fight certain local heresies. Um, so that's uh, that, that's where like the origin kind of comes. Where the controversy comes is in the, and I'm trying to get all of my dates right, which I probably will not, um, it around the year... Uh. 800 uh, <laughs> and around the year 800 um you had some frankish monks fighting with some orthodox in jerusalem and charlemagne gets all big mad calls a council and they have a bunch of different discussions about the filioque uh, and this leads to about a century worth of disputes between rome and the franks so the Franks, what they want to do is uh, they added the creed to a, to the liturgical services, which wasn't something that was done before. They added the creed to be sung at mass. Not only that, but they um, universally in the territories of Charlemagne added the filioque to be sung in the creed, which was, as I said before, something which had locally been done, something which was done the Athanasian creed, something which was already patristic language. It just happened to be uh, done in the creed. And the popes told them, hey, don't do that. Because really it was something of a pretense that the Franks were using. And if you just actually, rather than just spouting off, you know, much silver shields, <laughs> if you actually uh, like read what the Pope said when they were in these discussions, they said, hey, uh, you guys are using this as a pretense for calling the East Eastern tradition heretical. Like you were having theologians uh, like the... Uh, the Libri Carolingi, is it the Libri Carolini? Libri Carolini. Carolini. The Caroline the, books. Oh, Fatal yeah, the Libri point. Carolini. Uh, did you know that uh, Pope Hadrian the Second responded to that? I do, yeah. Yeah, because uh, what happened is in the Libri Carolini, uh, however you pronounce it. Libri Carolini. What is so hard? Libri Carolini. I want to add a G there so bad. Libri Carolini. Mm. In the Libri Carolini, they uh, said that through the sun was a heretical phrase. Um, so, yeah, Pope Hadrian responded to it and said, you absolute morons. Like, what are you <laughs> <laughs> Like, in, in, in short, you can read. I actually went back to, like, the uh, to the Mignet set, and I actually read in Latin the response of, <laughs> of Pope Hadrian. He's basically like, you absolute morons. What are you talking about? So yeah, they were saying stupid things like that. They were saying that the uh, the Greeks had taken the filioque out of the original Nicene Creed. Um, they were like, they, they were saying a bunch of dumb things. And this was before Photius, uh, mind you. Um, so they're saying a bunch of dumb things about the East. So the popes are like, yeah, you're not going to add the filioque to the creed. And because you guys have no authority to, uh, which is completely true. But what's super cool and uh, what's super fantastic is all of these popes have very large uh, corpuses, corpi, 
corpus e corpus e corpus e uh, corpuses yeah uh, corpus e remember corpus, corpus is body and it's actually neutral or neuter oh no. okay bodies corpa say bodies or cor very corpora. large corpora. very large bodies of writing so these popes wrote about the filioque way in a dogmatic way in okay. each and every single one of these taught the filioque dogmatically so that's very important they dogmatically taught the filioque they told the franks you better not put that in there because you guys are acting like idiots and i not i'm not gonna have to come over there every three seconds and and correct you so just don't do it uh, but they dogmatically taught it and what's super interesting is uh you have the rising of photius you get Photius condemned at the Fourth Council of Constantinople in 869. Then in uh, 879, Photius uh, basically bows <laughs> bows the knee to Rome, kisses the foot of Peter, and says, please, 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 I'll accept all the papal dogmas. And then Pope is like, oh, Pope John VIII is like, okay, you can come back. So they come back in the Union, which is not an unusual thing. Um, certain councils have exonerated heretics who are condemned or condemned heretics who were exonerated before uh, like, for example, uh, Chalcedon and uh, Second Constantinople does this with some of the Nestorians. Um, so it's not a, it's not the weirdest thing in the world that you have somebody who's condemned and then exonerated. Um, so seemingly uh, what you have from the 879 Council, the 879 Council, it just says, hey, if you add to the creed outside of heresy, if you add to the creed outside of danger of heresy or explanation of the faith, um, you're a stupid idiot and please stop doing that. And that's what they said against the Franks. But it never never says that you can't add the creed ever. It actually says the opposite when it says unless heresy. And so, yeah. But uh, what happens is after this, you have this big fighting in Bulgaria uh, because they were both Latin and Greek missionaries. They're like, oh, crap, what do we do? And the Pope says, you better not add the filioque. But if I wanted to, I could. And he actually says this. He's like, I can add to the filioque if I want to because I'm the Pope and I do whatever I want. Um, which is so TLDR, yeah, yeah. <laughs> t, t, basically, t, <laughs> yeah, t, TLDR, uh, the Orthodox are absolutely wrong to point to the Franks right. as an example, but okay, so eventually in the early 11th century, mm -hmm. the singing of the creed mm -hmm. gets added into the Roman mm -hmm. liturgy with the filioque, and filioque mm -hmm. takes a W, and 1053 schism happens, uh, the uh, second council of Leon, council of Florence, um. We won, uh, and Orthodox lost. Okay, there's the whole story. <sighs> okay, um, I, I, okay, I don't think I'm gonna ask you anything more about the third. Okay, but just, people just watch Christian Wagner's debate with David Erhan on. Sanctuary. Oh yeah, and mm. Alan Rule is right. So uh, Pope Stephen the Fifth wrote an emperor, wrote a wrote a letter to uh, Pope uh, Pope Emperor Basil, uh, stating that the uh, 869 Council was still in effect. So. Fair enough, fair enough. Thank you for so, that. At yeah. uh, hoc est ex uh, episcopae cranmer, uh, 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 episcopus romanus jurisdictionem in hoc regno non habet. Uh, 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 where's my, where's my, um, where's my, uh, I don't have my hat. I don't have my mug. Copious. The has the, <laughs> yeah, cop, yeah, real, real. Yeah, the Pope has half jurisdiction in this realm, in all realms. Set contra. Non habit for real, anyway. I can't wait till one day. Hey, for real, are you? I, I know you, you, you read Latin, I know you read it, but can you like converse in it or not? Uh, so I've tried having small conversations with people, and if it's on theological topics, it, it goes fine. Um, oh. I, I, I had a uh, this is actually kind of a cool moment. Um, I had a somebody who I wanted to converse with on discord and they were a theologian from portugal oh, wow. and they didn't know spanish which i kind of know spanish um and they didn't know english either well ordering ordering at taco bell doesn't count as spanish but yeah on. yeah yeah i know i know um but yeah hey I, i'm gonna defend myself i i took like five years of spanish and i i was in nicaragua for a while and then I uh, I worked with good thing you I pronounced that right. Nicaragua. Yeah, good thing. You <laughs> <laughs> so I know it's a minefield for people trying to pronounce that. <laughs> anyway, anyway, and um, 
what was I saying? Oh yeah. So Latin, uh, Latin, that's what we were talking about. So he didn't know English or Spanish and I can't really write in Greek that well. Uh, but he knew Latin. Um, so we kind of had a few, uh, snippets of a conversation in Latin because we needed to communicate over something. So that was, that was, that was kind of a cool experience, but yeah, I, I do it sometimes. Sick. That's why I intend to, um, with my learning that I'm starting up again with Latin to be, um, just, just full up, full orbed as if I'm learning another language, both literate and conversational. So if you can get to that level two, and if we can host like probably the first debate in Latin in like a century or two, how sick would that be? I don't know about a century or two. It seems to be that um, high profile. In, in yeah, high profile in Roman yeah. schools in like the 1950s and 60s. They were still oh no, no doubt about that. Yeah. yeah, but like like the kind that's like um like Luther and Eck or whatever big big tier debates in just in just in Latin. Now that, yeah, I just need to make our, sure my Latin our debate Latin. our debate, which we want to do at Davenant House on on tradition in latin <laughs> yeah and no, we have a grand I, I, will, I will provide people. i will i will be providing the translation of that <laughs> anywho matthew says i appreciate your guys video on soul scriptura and authority video with brian cross's argument that was such a relief that i wasn't going crazy when hearing those arguments yeah yeah appreciate that yeah it's um it's it's not the best argumentation from that side not gonna lie not gonna lie um but Thank you very much, Johnny G. Of course, I am the Giga Chad. Latin stream would be epic. I do intend to do that. Like, it's going to be a while, but once I am conversational, I do intend to have like a another sub channel just in Latin where I'll do content in Latin, including streams. And perhaps if there's other other people in our circles who are conversational with Latin, I'll get them on and we uh, we do that kind of thing and just uh, you know just just, just flex and all the on the plebs. In any case, in any case, let us move on to uh okay i already did that everything pope says is infallible um oh here's a fun one wagner you have heard that it was said that the second that second vatican council declares that jews and muslims are saved but you say okay so there's a very long history behind this as well translation cope but go on yeah, yeah cope cope real real so what we get is in the early ever since the early medieval um well early scholastic era 12th 13th century we have these ideas around culpability which begin to uh pop up we, we have discussions around okay if somebody i don't know uh the i think the the most stark example i give because a lot of people are would actually be genuinely confused of what to do if you had like a person who said i'm gonna nuke um i don't know uh what's a place that people would not want to be nuked um <clears> hey <throat> the old bay factory i'm gonna nuke the old bay factory and kill all of the old bay workers and their families uh, you don't know what old bay is it's a seasoning that's popular in maryland oh, i'm gonna I've heard of yeah, that. I've i'm gonna i'm gonna kill all of the workers at the old bay factory unless you fornicate with this woman a lot of people would have general um moral confusion of what to do with in that situation and to be honest a lot of people would probably just fornicate with the woman um in order to keep all of the old bay factory workers from dying now in this case uh due to the ignorance of the the uh, really what would be an invincible usually invincible ignorance of the law because in those situations um people you usually don't have well enough formed consciences to be able to discern the fact that they should not fornicate uh, with the woman and they should just let all of the old Bay factory workers and their poor families die. Uh, in that case, that person due to the essentially um, altering circumstances would not be culpable for that act. So they would have done something which is materially wrong, but not formally wrong. Mm -hmm. So we have that distinction gets played up a lot in the uh, in medieval scholastic circles. So eventually, uh, especially with the founding of the New World, uh, there are questions about all of these non-Christianized people, all of these non-evangelized people. They ask, hey, did all of these people go to hell? And the response was, okay, let's, let's think through this. So over, over the centuries, 
And this is not to say like, okay, this just kind of popped up at Vatican II, but it was there. There were people in you know, 16th, 17th century saying this, to clarify. Yeah, but those so, are forgeries. Yeah, forgery is real. So uh, th this, start, this starts to enter uh, into magisterial texts. Um, I point to a text from Benedict XIV that actually talks about uh, those outside of the church being martyrs before God. And, and so forth. So magisterial texts for centuries before Vatican II are talking about this, uh, are interpreting the tradition. And finally, in the 1950s, before Vatican II, we get this uh, very fiery Jesuit uh, by the name of Leonard Feeney. So Father Feeney, he decides that he really, really, really wants to convert all of the Protestants in America, which is a laudable goal. And he actually started converting a bunch of the more high-class Americans, people's kids, which was interesting. So people are kind of getting mad at him. And then he just starts to go uh, a little bit schizo when it comes to extra ecclesium nulla salus, which is outside of the church, there is no salvation. And rather than the common teaching of the church uh, before that point, which had been that um, there are certain cases in which someone may receive grace extraordinarily and um, and uh, be united unto our Lord Jesus Christ uh, in a explicit belief in the articles of faith, which implicitly contain the others, uh, which we can explain how that makes sense later. And also that there are uh, certain things called the baptism of desire, and then the uh, baptism of blood, which allows one to receive uh, the graces of the sacraments extraordinarily. Um, rather than that teaching, he said, like, nah, if you ain't baptized, you're done for. Uh, which obviously uh, uh, concerns some people because Basically, we have, man. yeah, we have what's called a uh, catechumenate. So since we have what's called a catechumenate, uh, it's like, okay, I want to be Catholic. You got to wait a year for baptism. Uh, sorry if you die. Um, <laughs> XOXO. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah that, that was Leonard Feeney and the Holy office responded, um, to Leonard Feeney, uh, and explained Mastici Corpus, which was a, uh, which was an encyclical by Pope Pius XII and, uh, summarized the teaching of the Catholic church on salvation outside of the church. Uh, which is basically uh, what I had just said, is that, and uh, I guess to make it succinct, when it comes to those outside of the church, well, in order to be saved, uh, I'll put it like this, in order to be saved, one needs to have fides formata, so formed faith, which is faith working by love. And uh, included in this are certain concomitant acts, like repentance, for example. Um, or we would call it uh, more precisely contrition. So one needs to be contrite for their sins. One needs to have faith, which is formed by charity. One needs to um, implicitly desire, or one needs to desire reception to the church. It's uh, basically what we would say. So when it comes to uh, the first one, contrition for your sins, you can imagine, you know, Somebody can be contrite uh, for their sins through the effects of grace um, in the catechumenate uh, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, the second, when it comes to fides formata, the formata part uh, seems pretty easy. But the fides part seems like the hard part. So what we would say is that when it comes to the, the sort of fundamentum of, of faith, we would point to Hebrews where uh, this is something going all the way back to like St. Thomas. So this isn't like weird modern Catholic stuff. Say that it talks about, um, talks about believing that God is and that he rewards those who seek him. So through the movements of grace, one can hate their sin. One can believe that God is and that he rewards those who seek him and have an openness for whatever he may reveal. So, um, and then also to have that desire to join the people of God, uh, which would implicitly contain the desire for the sacraments of baptism. And Archbishop Lefebvre, uh, who was actually a huge fan of, of this, he was a fan of baptism, sorry, he's a fan of um, the possibility of, of um, salvation outside of the uh, 
formal membership of the Church of Union, although I don't like canonical that boundaries. Canonical boundaries. There you go. That's a good language. He said basically what uh, what we mean by this is if a preacher came tomorrow and said, "Hey, this is the Catholic faith," they would say, "Oh yeah, I want to join that." <laughs> that that's what it is. Um. So yeah, uh, that, that seemed like a lot of rambling, uh, but yeah, it's a pretty big topic. So TLDR, Cope. you're not a, a Jew or a Muslim is not saved per se, just simply by being a, being a Jew or a Muslim, but only insofar as they have an invincible ignorance of the articles of faith and they are of such, they are of such a, like, if you will, proto faith where if a preacher yeah. came to them tomorrow, they would convert. Well, they do. They have faith. They have faith. Sure. Um, they just have faith in the fundamental articles from which all the others are contained. Right. Okay. So, um, but yeah, when, when it comes to invincible ignorance, what I want to clarify for people is that invincible ignorance is a negative term. It's not a positive term. Nobody is saved by invincible ignorance. Yes. There are, there are billions of people in hell who are invincibly ignorant about stuff. Um, every single person I'm sure is invincibly ignorant about something. Invincible ignorance does not save you. What invincible ignorance does do is invincible ignorance uh, removes the culpability that you have for a certain um, lack. That, that's all that's all it does. It's a negative thing. It's not a positive yeah. thing. Yep. So you can be invincibly ignorant, but still of a of a mind that's not conducive to faith. And so you'll see you later. Mm. Right. Cool. Cool. Um, one more, and then we're gonna jump to QA. And this is probably um because I watched some of your content on this, and assuming you're right, this would actually probably be one of the more niche myths of Aquinas since uh, of the oh, kind of spoiler there of the Roman faith since even uh, many academics parrot the same thing. But in sum, uh, Mr. Wagner, the Immaculate Conception is a dogma of the Roman faith. Yes, but of course. The man himself, Thomas Aquinas, the angelic doctor, the greatest of the doctors of the church, deny the Immaculate Conception. How do you respond to that? Well, personally, uh, I've... I take what is actually the traditional Dominican opinion on this matter, uh, going all the way back to like Cayetanus uh, said that St. Thomas denied the Immaculate Conception, but I personally think Cayetanus might have just been denying the Franciscan articulation of the Immaculate Conception, although that's a story for a different day. But going all the way back until late 16th century, I want to say. So this is very, very long back. Uh, the a traditional, and then even before that, there are Dominican authors who are saying that Aquinas um, said this. But the Dominican uh, frequently uh, articulated positions that St. Thomas did not deny the Immaculate Conception. There are certain points in which he says that we do not know when um, her sanctification happens. And uh, that's the closest thing that you get to a denial. But uh, really, he affirms a... Okay, I will I will put it like this, and don't clip this, and make sure you listen to everyone. Clip uh, this. What I say. Everyone clip this. Roman Catholics, and this is something that a, a certain group of theologians called the Somatocensis in the 17th century got in trouble for. Roman Catholics can say that Our Lady had original sin in Adam. Our Lady um, uh, was a child of wrath in Adam, and so on and so forth. But we have to be very clear what we mean. All right, everyone clip that before the butt. Yeah, yeah, clip, clip that before the butt. What we mean by that is that she is included under Adam's headship in the, in the sense of uh, having the debt to receive original sin. In St. Thomas, uh, he provides actually a good analogy. So let's say uh, Christ came back tomorrow and... Uh, brought us all up into heaven. Well, it says in Romans that the wages of sin is death. Um, shouldn't shouldn't we all die? We'd say, well, we have the debt of death. That doesn't necessarily mean that actual death will contract uh, for us. If you want to, if you want to interpret that in terms of physical death. But anyways, the uh, the um, distinction works. We speak of ha having the personal debt to receive something versus actually contracting something. So what St. Thomas is going to teach is St. Thomas is going to say Our Lady had the had the personal debt that uh, her as a person, body and soul, had the personal debt to contract original sin. 
to contract because original sin is that privation of original justice, that stain. But we would say that uh, there is an intermediate uh, singular privilege which cleansed her um, from that debt, which remitted that debt, if you want to put it like that, to where uh, she would not you know, receive that privation. So this is different than the Franciscan per, uh, position, as I understand it, <clears throat> who work uh, from this more from the position of uh, Mary's predestination, which is of a singular, um, is of a singular uh, decree with the predestination of Christ, where the Franciscans would tend more to say that uh, Our Lady was not under the headship of Adam, where we would say, well, it's just the teaching of scripture that in Adam, uh, all, all of, it's a dogma of the Catholic church that all who uh, are descendants from Adam are somehow um, morally included in his fall. Like we can't just, mm -hmm. you know, skirt this issue. And uh, I would say that's in more line with the magisterial documents as well. Uh, but I, I think this actually makes a lot more sense out of the biblical data uh, which talks about the uh, totality of the effects of Adam. I think it, it would actually be a little unnatural um, to have anyone but Jesus Christ uh, excluded from those texts. And I would just say that that is um, formally, of course, talking about the privation, but uh, that a, uh, a certain debt would also include one under that. I think it's in more in line with the statements of the fathers, there are certain fathers who, uh, of course, as we know, uh, Origen, uh, St. John Chrysostom, uh, and others who would have affirmed uh, something that is not in line with the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. Although I kind of question Origen. But... So someone clipped that uh, Chrysostom's a heretic. Go on. Yeah, well, that's what St. Thomas Aquinas said. Ooh, spicy meatballs. So yeah, he, he said, so he said yeah, he said that St. John of Christ, St. John went too far. I think that's the exact quote. He went too far, <laughs> which is an understatement. It's so, over, um, right? uh, but I, I would say this makes more sense out of like the Augustinian statements, which, um, and the statement, like the statements, the orth, like Craig Truly and the Orthodox are going to bring up and say, oh, all of these Western fathers talking about, um, Our Lady being included in original sin. If you, I, I think the way to read that, is talking about the debitum colpe originalis, the um, the debt of original sin, rather than uh, the actual contraction of original sin. Okay, fair enough. So TLDR, um, there is a distinction in what we're referring to sin, whether it be the actual debt of sin, or the act, or sorry, the debt of sin, or the actual contraction. There. Yeah, are. there. There's a lot. There's a lot of uh, nuance and distinction to make. And of course, all of this, as people are saying, like mud distinctions and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. <laughs> of course, it's going to seem like that because this is something which is explicative rather than demonstrative. So I'm just trying to explain it to you. I'm not necessarily trying to demonstrate it to you. Uh, but there, there's more distinctions we can bring in, like with the Fomus Picathi um, and with uh, trying to think of other distinctions that would be helpful, which actually I, I think we could demonstrate the uh, teaching of the Catholic Church on the Immaculate Conception. Um, but, you know, that, that's kind of a story for another day. Fair enough. And what particular works, I forgot to ask for Vatican II as well, but what particular works would you recommend on this issue of Aquinas and the Immaculate Conception? That is a good question. Um, Maybe even just reading Aquinas himself or? Yeah, so there's a there's that and there's a work by uh, Norbertus del Prado. Uh, who wrote after Ineffabilis Deo, um, Deus, Ineffabilis Deus. Um, he wrote after it and said that actually uh, the Thomistic position is the best way of reading the bull. Uh, so that he's a major source, but he's um, not in English. Uh, there's also, um, oh, that's in Latin as well. Um, I guess you could read uh, Garigou, his commentary on Tertia Pars. 
he they uh, some some theolog some later Dominican theologians distinguish kind of a tertium quid and say that um, Saint Thomas uh, kind of waffles at a certain point in his life, which I agree with, and I said that I agree with. Um, so I don't really know whether it's a third position, um, but yeah, he he kind of takes a third position, uh, having a little bit of a more negative reading of the Summa than I have. But it's very clear in the Ave commentary before he dies that he affirms the uh, what's called the nec originale, so the neither original. So he says that Our Lady had neither uh, mortal nor venial nor uh, original sin in her. But nec originale, um, so for those who are going to say, oh, my textual notes, um, every, <laughs> single, every single copy of it, I think every single preprint copy of it, except like two or three, has the neck originale. That and from the uh, from like sort of scribal data, we can think about. Okay, we have these Dominicans who are, you know, against the Immaculate Conception. Who would have more to sort of gain from uh, somebody adding it or somebody striking it? You know, so, yeah, right. Uh, that's that's kind of it. Fair enough. Um, and I think uh, sorry, I also forgot to ask um, for Vatican II on the um or just generally on the nature of um of, salvation of, outside the church yes yeah, uh, so the church, monsignor fenton um let me try to the f-e-n-t-o-n yeah fenton uh what is what is uh, the catholic church and salvation that's what it's called um, too easy Salvation in light of the recent pronouncement by the Holy Office. Church. There we go. Monsignor Fenton, Catholic Church and Salvation. There we go. Too easy. Too easy. All right. Um, are there, um, before we move to Q&A, do you have any other myths in mind that I haven't brought up that you'd like to? Uh, we are justified by faith alone. Oh, justification. Yes, I completely forgot about that. So actually there's a question someone put. So I guess saving the best for last in a way. Um, there was one question that I saved here on the issue. So I guess it's a good uh, segue. Uh, what is the Catholic interpretation of Romans 4 where it compares our justification to that of Adam's where he is justified before doing anything but believing? And so I guess that opens up to the wider view of justification in Rome. Yeah, so the Catholic Church um, and the Protestants often use the term justice equivocally. And we use terms like merit equivocally and it gets really annoying and it gets kind of frustrating at one point because I'm reading people that are otherwise very brilliant, like Bishop John Davenant, for example. And then I read him interpreting St. Thomas on condign merit. And it's just like, he's turned into like, I would expect to read something like this from like a freshman theology student from Baylor writing on Twitter or something. Uh, so it gets, it gets very frustrating. Um, when it comes to justification, and I have I have a clip about this, I think. So if I misstate here or sound like an idiot here, uh, I have a whole playlist I think of just videos on the the Roman Catholic teaching on justification. But as a as a TLDR, we believe that we are justified by fides formata, so faith, uh, formed faith or faith working. Uh, through charity. And that is uh, really what we would describe as justice, which is because justice is just the right rectitude of the soul towards God. So when we talk about justification, we think, okay, it's making us just. <laughs> and that's, that's literally what, just what we think about. Um, that this fides formata, um, which is present in the soul, which flows from sanctifying grace, which is the elevation of the nature of the soul, which flows forth into the faculties. Um, that this uh, formed faith is the right ordering of the faculties of the soul in relation to God as supernatural object. So unless this fides formata is destroyed, one is um, said to be in a state of grace. They're, they're just. Um, and the any sort of increase of justice that's spoken of is a... Um, is an increased disposition which uh, disposes us to 
towards a greater effect of grace uh, within us. That's all we mean by an increase of, uh, of justification. And then there's also a, an aspect in which um, we have a Christological aspect to this as well that we, that we will speak in. No way. Christological aspect of justification? No way. Yes. Yes. <laughs> So uh, in our in our Christological aspect, which this is actually brought forth by uh, Kaitamus in his responses to Luther, uh, which are very good, uh, that basically we as united to Christ our head, as mystically united to Christ our head, this union uh, becomes the foundation, and of course we be we become uh, members of his body, and in becoming members of his body the influx of the grace of our head uh, flows into us. So our grace is grace, which is Christ's grace given to us by Christ. Uh, therefore, we can speak of our righteousness as Christ's righteousness, not, not our own righteousness. And of course, we, we, we say that we actually have an even more extreme view uh, than total depravity, uh, which your audience would, would like to, um, I'm sure, uh, like to hear about. We don't only believe that it's Pelagian, to say that um, sinful man cannot assent to, uh, can make an act of faith. We think that natural man, uh, even like if we could think about what's called a, a state of pure nature, so a state in which Adam was not given any grace. We don't think Adam could could make the ascent of faith because we really think that the uh, that sanctifying grace itself is an elevation of the soul. Um, to a supernatural mode of operation. I remember, um, have you ever read Richard Field by any chance? He um, is an old, really underrated, honestly, Anglican theologian, like late 16th, early 17th century. So really quite foundational. His book, um, big book um, of the church, which was it, it basically what the laws of ecclesiastical polity was against the Puritans um, of the church was against Rome from the Anglicans. But, I remember reading that and that's actually at the very start of his book where he actually, uh, cause initially I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't really buy that whole idea. Like why would pre sin natural man need that? But the way he explained it was basically as um, that with man, we, we have our natural ends, but we also have a, we also have super supernatural desires. And so without that, without that, uh, without that grace coming to us, man, operates whereas natural animals they 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 just have a straight line from their beginning to reaching their ends like they satisfy their natural ends and that's it they're complete in that way but because man both has that natural ends and also supernatural ends um they actually man actually kind of naturally moves in a circle where we're kind of moving forward but then we're kind of brought back to the start because we can't um reach that supernatural end by nature precisely because it's not in nature and so grace is then what actually brings us directly to that end so his articulation just as a side side thing i think that was a good articulation of, of that concept yeah I, I guess i've become more uh this is connected but i've become more interested in uh the concept of what's called the supernatural organism mm -hmm. so basically what the way we're going to articulate it which is probably quite amenable to the protestant thought the sanctifying grace um is is going to be that elevation of the soul uh to a supernatural mode of action it's something which is an accident um it's an accident which elevates so this was bovink was wrong to read thomas as saying it's a substance it's uh, said to be an entitative accident which is probably what confused him uh which you guys don't ne really need to worry about but what's important is just as the the we have the nature of our soul and then all of the various faculties of our soul and the relation of those faculties to different objects so also, uh, which multiplies the the virtues and uh, such in our soul. So also in the supernatural life, we have the uh, the supernaturalization of our faculties. So our intellect with faith, our will with charity, our will towards future good with hope, um, and then we also have the the perfecting of those habits with the gifts of the Holy Ghost, um, and then the uh, the the infused moral virtues as well, which place even natural things in light of god this idea of the supernatural organism which is basically hey we got grace and grace turns everything uh into a sort of um supernatural mode of acting and, and turns everything 
uh, into a into directing it towards our final end, um, mm-hmm. rather rather than having some sort of quasi naturalistic uh, way of thinking about the the Christian life. Fair enough. And so TLDR with that, Rome. We are system- justified by by faith alone. Yes, and it's particularly, and the question is over: What do we mean by faith? And it's not a, um, it's not a uh, in this, it's not a same or uni. What's like, what's like a term that means like one sense? Like there's equivocal, but then there's also uh, whatever. Univocal. No, not univocal. Because I'm talking about two different, two different terms. But basically, there's not, there's not Rome. Unlike what's popularly believed. Um, Officially, because obviously there can be arguments about well whether the implications of Rome's teaching are there were, but otherwise, officially, if you want to know what they actually what they claim to teach, Rome officially does not teach that one is justified by faith and by works in the same equal sense. Yeah. Um, so Saint Thomas, he has a very, and this might help for the people who seem to be a bit confused in the comments. Uh, Saint Thomas, he has a statement where he says, "We are not justified by works of justice, but by the virtue of justice." So it's it's not the idea um, that when we say charity, it's not the idea that uh, like you say X Hail Marys and help old lady cross the street and um, say hi to Pope Francis on Twitter. And if you do those good good things, and then that always uh, the fornication and whatever that you did the other night. Um, that these are somehow, you know, equaling each other. If you like enough of Pope Francis's tweets, number goes good or up. And uh, <laughs> uh, it's not, it's not that idea. Rather, it's, it's a, it's a habit. So it's a disposition of a faculty towards well acting. So it's something which is in the soul. It's disposition, which is going to be something which uh, flows forth naturally into certain acts. But formally speaking, we're not justified by acts of charity but by the love which inheres in our soul and uh, vivifies faith. So would you, um, so what would you say then about uh, in light of that, those helpful comments about, uh, about Pope Francis comments about how Luther did not err on justification. How would you respond to that? I, I think, I think Pope Francis. <laughs> I think I think Francis was wrong. Uh, I think he's he's going off of. Yeah, yeah, he's going off of the. Um, clip that, clip that, people. Yeah, yeah, 1995 Joint Declaration on Justification. Is it the 1995 Joint Declaration on Justification? 1990 something. Yes. Yeah. So the Joint Declarations on the Doctrine of Justification. That is what Pope Francis is going off of when he says that Luther did not err on justification. Uh, Pope Francis, he's not a scholar. Um, He's really not uh, too interested in matters of history uh, when it comes to this issue. He's he's really just an ecumenical guy who's saying nice things. It's like like the the picture... I hope uh, you better be careful with those comments. None can judge the whole. The first yeah, seat. true. It, it's like the. It's kind of like the picture that you get with uh, Pope Paul the Sixth with the Archbishop of Canterbury, where he's um, giving him the the ring, and it's just like you you look through Pope uh, Saint Paul the Sixth uh, writings, and you can look when he comments on Anglicans, he's like, yeah, they're fake bishops. So it's like he's like, oh, I'm doing nice thing by giving you like a, an Episcopal ring, but it's like, yeah, I still don't think you're a real bishop. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's, it's, I, I think, monopoly money. Yeah, it basically, I, I think a lot of times um, these <sighs> Pope Francis had good intentions with what he said, but I think it's pretty vacuous, unfortunately. Uh, and f- yeah, from my from my less than professional opinion, uh, it's it's very 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 clear that uh, there is still a significant distinction between what Rome teaches and what Protestants teach. Uh, especially, especially concerning um, the intrinsic efficacy of grace and its intrinsic ordering towards glory. And then also specifically the the nature of the ascent of faith. I don't think the fiduciary faith, while similar to fides formata, I don't think it's the same thing. So, uh, yeah, unfortunately, 
Um, I think the Holy Father is wrong on this point. Okay, fair enough. I guess we can now move on to Q&A, ladies and gentlemen. So as usual, remember, uh, supporters on Locals, and by the way, Locals in the description uh, below if you guys want to go there. I uh, forgot to mention that. <laughs> supporters on Locals, and uh, super, and uh, I see you smiling at the comments there. <laughs> and Super Chats, get priority with Q&A. And there's a few questions that I've already starred for, uh, for viewing, so um, I will get to those, uh, or if I find Supporters or Super Chats first, I will get to those first. I am prepared. <laughs> I'm getting ready to prepare. Hyper qualified, extremely nuanced video tile. Why Christian B. Wagner is a set of a cantus. No, it's reasoning the allergy live, and I'm your host, Michael Laufton. Today, I need to destroy Christian B. Wagner for his comments destroying Pope Francis's view on Martin Luther's view of justification. No, 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 no. You got now, me. we we out here, we fight against the schismatics in defense of Martin Luther. You got the wrong terminology. He says, now we need to address uh, Christian B. Wagner's slander against the Holy Father. It's unnuanced. It's uncharitable. <laughs> and it's not hyper-qualified. And it's not hyper-qualified. Oh, man, there's so many other jokes I could make, but I don't think they're appropriate for here. <laughs> in any case, in any case, get the Q&A happening, people. I think there's a couple of questions. Vent Ventura, got wrong, Ventura, I'm not going to answer that question, but it's the first. <laughs> if you put that on the screen i'm gonna kill you paul <laughs> mini heart attack then did you <laughs> yeah i did <laughs> oh city the immaculata leave lofton alone oh man we love our brother like a sequel to leave Brittany alone or we something love our brother Mike. anyway anyway how do you feel about pastor about constantine changing christianity and arresting pastor jim No answer. I'm speechless. I'm speechless. He's completely speechless. So ever. It's all ogre now. Um, Roman Catholic myth number one, according to T. Gordon, not enough gym memberships. Roman Catholics lack Joey Swalls in the pews. Comments? Um, I have a lot of things I would like to say about Timothy Gordon, but none of them on this stream. <laughs> Fair enough. How good is uh, Return with a V? Have you tried the service yet? Uh, I think it is a systematic um, money-making scheme. And, uh, Timothy, if you're watching this, uh, you can uh, send my lawyer an email about your lawyer or whatever you're going to do. You're going to threaten to sue people on Twitter and tag your lawyer. And then you... I think it's a systematic um, abuse of the insecurity that a lot of younger men uh, and slightly older men uh, have when it comes to dating. So, I mean, there's guys in their late twenties, early thirties who are really zealous for finding a woman. They can't find it. And uh, Timothy Gordon is uh, taking advantage of this in order to make money off of it. And I think it's actually quite despicable what he's doing. Um, so I hope his, I really, really, really hope something happens to his YouTube channel. I really, really, it, he's honestly number one of anybody I wish would their YouTube channel would explode and never come back. It'd be Timothy Gordon um, along with Jay Dyer. Um, uh, there's a few more people I'm sure I can think of. Yeah. I think Timothy Gordon is uh, a pretty evil person. Um, yeah, I guess that's all I'll say. And just as a reminder, people, um, the comment, the opinions of my guests are not necessarily shared by myself. So <laughs> there you go. You heard it there first, folks, from uh, very spicy, very fascinating. I feel like the return site could be uh, could be the subject of a CoffeeZilla video. You know CoffeeZilla? No. He's a, he's a guy who talks a lot about uh, about a lot about like modern uh, current financial scams and schemes, typically in the crypto universe, but also sometimes just other digital like financial scams and controversies. So I don't know. Yeah, JTF, nice try. We're not talking. We're not talking about that question on this stream. Yeah, hi, nice hi, try. Hi, Fed. Hi, nice gone? try. Hello, nice Federal try. Agent. Hello, Federal if we're agent. on a, if look, speaking for myself, if I was on another, um, if I was on another platform right now, which will be the case in the future. Different story, but otherwise, yeah, no, not here. 
Um, in any case, um, we also have uh, Savonarola was the father ultimate of his day. Thoughts? Savonarola is a servant of God in the Roman Catholic Church. Father Altman is mentally ill. I really think Father Altman's mentally ill. I, I mean, I don't... To be oh. fair, I think Father Altman was actually mistreated. And I think... So I really actually do feel for him. Um, I, I think he was mistreated. But I, I do definitely think that he's not all there in the head. Uh, but yeah, Savonarola was not Father Altman. Uh, Savonarola was a eminent philosopher and theologian and preacher and churchman of his day. And Alexander the sixth made a huge, huge mistake uh, burning him at the stake. But yeah, I guess that's it. But I, I do think Savonarola shouldn't have, uh, shouldn't have put his private uh, um, revelations, his private revelations uh, above the public authority of the church. I think that was, a mistake, but I still love Savonarola. Um, I still venerate Savonarola. So, you mean worship? What Savonarola deserved what he got? You, oh, oh dear. <laughs> hmm. hmm, let's move on, shall we? <laughs> no, no. Oh, you don't want to move on? No, no, Savonarola deserved what he got. Oh my gosh! You better be joking. I hope I hope you won't I hope you won't stand before the, our Lord Jesus Christ at the final judgment and say that you think that Savonarola, the holy martyr of God, deserved what he got. Anywho, crazy. Anywho, regarding interpretation with the proper hermeneutics, I assume our ability to know with great confidence slash certainty only applies to the literal sense question mark yes because as saint thomas teaches in his uh book one of his sentences commentary distinction one uh, no prologue uh article five um <clears throat> he teaches that the when it comes to symbolic theology that is uh theology which works off of uh certain signs that aren't words therefore signs that could uh, take a number of significations. So basically like kind of signs of signs, if you want to put it like that, uh, they can, uh, we can't make demonstrative arguments, uh, from these on their own, on their own. So, um, okay. uh, you, you cannot, you cannot have, uh, infallible certainty when it comes to the proper, uh, spiritual sense. Uh, without any, without another sort of source, so um, you can have uh, infallible certainty about the spiritual sense of um, Sarah and Hagar from the Book of Galatians, for example. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, speaking of Savonarola, uh, young Anglican, good to see you, mate. I desperately want to hear Christian's defense of Savonarola. Does he defend his theology or also his political movement? Yeah, so his theology wasn't in error. I've listened to, or yeah, I actually did listen because I didn't read them. I, I like didn't listen to the original recordings. I listened to, through a few of his sermons, which are very good, uh, very very good. Listened through um, his work of the Triumph of the Cross, which is a very early and very good work of um, apologetics, a uh, kind of in line with something like Summa Contra Gentiles. Uh, and he is an Orthodox theologian. Also, his commentary on Psalm 51, which was very popular in Protestant circles, actually. Uh, he's Orthodox. Um, he, uh, to my knowledge, doesn't teach anything heretical. Uh, his issues um, were basically his uh, private revelations. That had that was a huge issue. Faith, uh, which some of them, some of them were correct. Some of them came to pass, and then some of them, which is like, oh, the Turks will convert all to Christianity in ten years. It's like, okay, yeah. Well, as it is written, a day to the Lord, a day to the Lord is like a thousand years to us. And hey, maybe the the Turks will convert. Either way, either way. Um, man, there's got a lot of questions here. 
Uh, John Colorafi, good to see you here, mate. Who is the author of the Sacra Theologia Summa? My apologies for coming in late. The Spanish Jesuits. There wasn't um, Jesuits. There wasn't just one author. Yeah, back when the, back in the 1950s when they yeah. were good. I, I will say actually that period of the Jesuits they're actually pretty darn good. My my favorite work on historical method is um, it's literally called a guide to historical method, and it's by a Jesuit priest, Father Gilbert Garrigan, from uh, the late 40s, early 50s. Um, it's very good, very 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 good. So. There are actually some decent Jesuit stuff out there. Believe it or not. Believe it or not. Um, fuck, we have a lot of questions coming in here. Da, 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 da. Uh, cardinals are not biblical. How can Catholicism cope? Is this is this like a joke question or something? Oh no, it's a dead serious question. I have to. Is it? No, no, no. Okay, good. It better not be. It better be a joke question. Okay. <laughs> um. 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 Okay. Do boom. Um. Uh. uh, um, uh um, uh, uh, um, uh, okay. Uh, uh, classic. Absolutely classic. Um, okay. A real question since Matt brought this up, what is the primary error of the Jensenist critique of frequent communion? That this is going to get us into spicy territory. Um, okay. So, you know, no, I'm not even going to go there. So basically there is a legitimate tradition in the Catholic church which is a tradition which is uh, shared by many of the popes and authors who are often quoted in support of frequent communion, who do uh, heavily emphasize the preparation necessary for the Eucharist in such a way as to uh, argue for a less frequent communion, practically speaking. So among all the authors, the principles are the same. Basically, as uh, the communion communion is a means of grace, and since it's a communion, since it's a means of grace, as much as one is able to, it is good to receive communion. But on the other hand, it's also a principle that one needs to have proper preparation, as Saint Paul talks about preparation both of the soul and of the body. So, uh, this leads to in different pastoral situations, you'll have some saying. Uh, receive every day <laughs> and you have others saying uh you should be receiving once a year uh the church only requires once a year uh but saint augustine has a very good principle where he says um in essence to liz live as if you were to receive communion every day um so yeah uh when it comes to the jansenistic critique of frequent communion um they were right in the sense that um to emphasize the preparation necessary is important. And that is something that Catholic authors have always done. Okay. Okay. Is your epistemology better than Jay Dyer's? Yes. <laughs> because in order for my epistemology to be true, I need to presuppose that. That's so true. Hey, so <laughs> true. That That's literally the Trent Horn Jay Dyer debate in like one sentence. <laughs> I don't know if you watched that, but oh man. Yeah, I watched it. It was terrible. Oh. Oh man, that was fun. That was very, very fun. Uh, let's unmark that. How do I get into philosophy and become big brain like you? So clearly he's talking about me, but I'll let you answer it. Um, so there's a good work. Uh, let me try to pull it up. What is that called? Oh, that's what it's called. Retard. Yes. Okay. Are. So there's a work by Charles Copens, Comprehensive Introduction to Scholastic Philosophy and Theology. Oh, I can join the chat. Oh crap, I have to connect my YouTube. Ah, I'll just put it in the private chat and Paul can put it. Too easy. Um there it is. So that right there has a comprehensive introduction to scholastic philosophy and theology. That'll introduce you to a lot of the concepts. Um, so just yeah. your page in general or particular? Yeah, it's my page in general. Okay. So there's other books I recommend as well. But Copen's down there, bottom right, very, very good. Uh, what's very important is to, with scholastic philosophy in particular, is to understand it's kind of like learning a new language. So a lot of people get frustrated and just say like, oh, why do I have to learn all these fancy terms? 
Well, it's because you're getting inculcated into a tradition. Hmm. So it's important to understand the like common references of that tradition. Like if somebody references Albertus Magnus, knowing who Albertus Magnus is, is important or the, the language which is used. And this is a very helpful tool um, for, uh, for the use of the individual. So oftentimes it's going to involve reading, but it's also gonna involve uh, listening to videos of people who do scholastic theology stuff, interacting uh, probably online with people who do scholastic theology and philosophy stuff. So yeah, that's, okay. uh, that, that's probably about it. <clears throat> I've got another personal question about this as well. Um, when are you going to uh, when are you going to hire a decent designer for your covers? Never. Uh, I like I like to you're keeping alive the dichotomy of books with beautiful covers but crap content versus good content with crap covers. Thank you. Very cool. I I do my part. I do my part. These are much better than my other ones, though. So I actually kind of have to agree with that. The the gray background for those other ones on Amazon. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> if Protestant true, why Ignatius say Catholic? That's a good point. I'm stumped. I, I would say words, but I'd probably stutter all over them in response to this. It's so over. Which post-conciliar Pope do you think was the most theologically knowledgeable? From Duncan EO. Good to see you, mate. Pope Francis. <laughs> so just it's, been, it's obviously benedict the 16th okay <laughs> <laughs> actually you know Ooh. i have i have the insanely controversial opinion that i think that pope francis is more conservative than benedict the 16th I feel like theologically do you, yeah. do you just think that benedict the 16th was more um benedict the 16th knew how to uh because i mean benedict the 16th he was the head of the CDF for like a freaking million years. <laughs> so he, he knew how to like play the Roman game, like with like, he basically knew how to play a politician kind right. of with this, So he's very careful with the way he spoke. He's very careful to distinguish his own personal opinions from papal teaching and so on and so forth. But Pope Francis is just like, Meh. I'm just going to go out and say whatever. Uh, but yeah, I, I think generally speaking in private opinions, uh, Pope Francis is more conservative than Benedict. We have an insane number of questions. So I think I might, uh, for my own self, I think I might only have to might only be able to go for like another three perhaps. So, uh, yeah, I do need to go soon. So too easy. So we will, uh, we will do that. Um, not that one, not that one. Uh, far out. There is a lot of these. Um, okay. Uh, how is the fullness of Christ's body present in multiple Eucharists at once? Okay, so when the substance of something is naturally present, the fullness of that thing is present via what's called concomitance or that which uh, naturally comes uh, comes with. So this is, uh, this is something which is spoken of by St. Paul when rather than referring to the Eucharist as we usually do as the body of Christ, he refers to the, uh, the body as uh, the bread is the participation of the body of Christ and the blood is the participant well, the wine is the participation of the blood of Christ. So when it comes to the natural substance, which uh, remember by natural substance, we don't mean something which is corporeal or physically extended or locally uh, present. Rather, we mean something which is substantially uh, present. Uh, from this substantial presence, uh, one via this concomitance receives the whole Christ. And uh, to the question of how it can be present in multiple Eucharists at once, uh, I've never seen anybody, uh, and uh, Lord willing, we'll never see anybody, argue against the metaphysical possibility of multilocation, only if proper multilocation, which the Thomists actually agree with, and argue against the SCOTUS only because the SCOTUS kind of uh, will say that there's a quasi local presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Um, so yeah, that's that's just generally the answer. But sorry for all that jargon. All good, all good. And one from my legendary supporter Lee, uh, Kowalski. Apologies for not saying this earlier because I don't have uh, I don't have specific like 
badges or whatever on YouTube for supporters and locals. But in any case, if we Prots and Rome have a lot more in common on justification than some Protestants make out, can you highlight the key differences we have? We still debate about it a lot. So I think you talk about it a bit, but I, if, if you feel like rehashing. Yeah, so there's, there's two that I usually point to, um, which the second one I'm going to sub-distinguish on, so be careful for that. So the first one is when it comes to the way in which we each define faith. So we're going to define faith as the ascent of the mind to the articles of the faith on the basis of God revealing. And that's how we def define the theological virtue of faith. And of course, in scripture, it's usually not used in this way. This is obvious, like a toddler can, can see this is not usually the way in which this is used in scripture. In scripture, it's generally referred to that virtue which brings about justification, the virtue which brings about justification. And oftentimes, well, actually, uh, it's something which in scripture is going to include a lot of things. It's going to include things like uh, true repentance for one's sins. Um, it's going to include, uh, obviously, belief in the facts of the gospel. It's going to include the virtue of hope. It's going to include at least a certain affection and at least some sort of virtual intention to uh, receive the sacraments, to obey the law of God. Um, it's going to include a lot of things in the scriptural usage. Uh, so we, uh, in the Roman Catholic church, we just generally refer to this as living faith or fides formata, faith formed by love, which, uh, antecedent to this and consequent upon it will contain things like contrition, uh, implicit desire to receive the sacraments or explicit desire to receive the sacraments, uh, does, uh, intention to obey the law of God and, and so on and so forth. So the difference comes in with the fact that the Protestants usually have a lot more of a narrow interpretation of this. Um, although uh, some days, some days I wake up and I think that probably fiduciary faith might mean something similar, but fiduciary faith is often more concerned with uh, the subjective application of the benefits of Christ than it is uh, in Roman Catholicism, which usually has to do with the objective reality of um, of the person and work of Christ and that which he teaches, which I think is probably fair enough since Luther is usually more concerned. Well, I know Luther, uh, I'm quoting Luther to support uh, positions, but um, I think Luther in particular seems more concerned with uh, believing oneself uh, to... Uh, or at least having trust in God for oneself um, rather than something which is more general than that. Fair so I, I, th I think when it comes to that uh, with uh, the virtue of faith, and then on the other hand, also with uh, um, merit, where when it comes to sanctifying grace, uh, Protestants are, agree are going to agree that there is some sort of idea in which we can speak of merit. And this is something which is, uh, extrinsic, uh, something by the uh, purely by the uh, ordination of God, extrinsic ordination of God, which the Scotists actually basically say the same thing. So uh, this is actually an acceptable view within Roman Catholicism. But that's not the position I take. I take the position of the Thomists that uh, sanctifying grace because it is supernatural is intrinsically ordered to uh, the attitude to our rewards. Okay. Wow. Thank you for that comprehensive answer. Um, maybe second last question, because I don't really get it a huge amount, but thank you again for the insane super chats, Max the Confessor. Uh, agree or disagree? St. Athanasius says that Christ is identical to himself as the incarnate human Christ, like me when I wiggle my toe. Do you, do you understand this? Or? I don't understand, bro. Yeah, me neither. Um, so... <sighs> Let's because this is a supporter. Let's try and put in the noose juice. Let's and and try to. I don't know. You skip. Him. You skipped some. You skipped some uh, super chats up there. From him. No, no, no. I, I went through a bunch of them from him. Oh, yeah, we went through a bunch of them earlier from Max Confessor super chats. Mm. They're mostly joke ones though, <laughs> if you remember. But oh, anyway, yeah. um, he says, "Lol, I need a quote later." Well, okay, if I may apply the noose juice, um. I'll Christ is identical to himself. True. Um, <laughs> By definition, anybody is sure, identical to themselves. Yeah. <laughs> sure. 
Um, Christ is identical to himself as the incarnate human Christ. So basically like what anti anti JWs who distinguished the logos and the No, I think if I had to guess, this is probably a quote that Monophysites use. Mm, maybe. Yeah, Are we right. wearing the same shirt? Uh, like, uh, no, it's, no, it's different. No, I don't think so because this is an Aussie brand, but um, and not like an Aussie home brand. But yeah, Athanasius, you absolute legend. Good to see a hi, Paul and Christian B. Wagner. Good to Hello, see Athanasius. Good to see Athanasius. Good to see him. Um, but yeah, I think okay. Real last question. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> some of these questions are just absolute jokes. Okay, I want to finish with like a serious, like decent question. Um. Because there's not, I'm not gonna lie. There's not a whole, there's not a whole ton. Um, actually, this might be a good send off. Given the decay of the church in countries like Germany, Brazil, Mexico, etc., what do you think is the future of the church? Is there a light, or is it over? Hmm. Benedict the Sixteenth has a very good statement where he says that the future of the church is really a lot smaller. Um that we're going to go through a period in the history of the Catholic church that is going to be, we're not, we're not going to have the same sort of political and social prominence that we had, uh, especially like, well, I guess in recent memory, like we, we could, we could still like in the seventies uh, with the, I think it was like 60s, seventies with the league of decency, we could still get movies like <laughs> banned. Like that's crazy. We could, with the league of decency, um, let me see. When was this? Yeah. The league of decency, uh, with movies with, yeah, the national league of decency was a, was a Catholic group who Catholics would like prompt, basically promise to not watch movies that were, uh, um, that were on this list of the league of decency and like people would listen. And they uh, and these movies would just absolutely flop, and they wouldn't publish these movies with nudity anymore. But of course, it got ruined when a movie was made about the Holocaust with nudity, and they said we're not going to watch it. And then you know, scratch cried anti-Semitism. This is a real story, actually. Seriously, is, yeah, yeah. Which I mean, for for and anybody who knows, it's about that. Schindler's List, I assume. No, no, it wasn't about Schindler's oh. List. It was about the one before Schindler's List. Oh, okay, because Schindler's List that did have nudity um, in it. But but it was yeah. it wasn't like oh sex and all that stuff. It was like they're being stripped down in the showers and all that. Yeah, no, it was sexual nudity in the. Oh, okay, movies. interesting. But yeah, we we have we had that sort of social influence. That social influence is going away, and the church kind of needs to ask herself, what are we doing? Um, like, does it believe even in the social kingship of Christ? That's kind of the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like okay, we obviously we would say like even in the second third century when we didn't have the uh like the kings we didn't have the emperors we didn't have the officials we would say we still believed in the social kingship of christ even back then even though we didn't have the offices so today we we no longer have the offices so how are we still going to believe in the social kingship of christ but really the future of the church there's kind of two ways in which the the church could go and unfortunately the at least to my pastoral sensibilities, which aren't too great. Uh, the the first way could is a um, a certain way of keeping people in the pews. So uh, by this, they kind of just want to uh, tolerate tolerate certain. There, and of course, I I, I think this this is going to sound bad on the surface, but there's a way in which you agree with this. We ought to tolerate certain evils that greater evils do not come about. Mm -hmm. So this is yeah. like the uh, the teaching amongst some that we ought to tolerate prostitution, for example, so that adultery does not fill the land. Which maybe we can ask ourselves that with now in things like pornography. Or, yeah, like well, I think we can, or, or like I'd, Tinder or things like that. We yeah, I, I, would, I would definitely debate those applications of the rule, but the principle itself. Is yeah, yeah, yeah. The principle. Yeah. I don't think that's actually a legitimate <laughs> application of the rule. Yeah, uh, I think the tradition with that application is wrong. But we tolerate certain evils that greater evils don't come about. Yeah, um, and that's what the pastoral uh, sort of mindset of the current leadership of the church has been for a very long time. Yeah, and then there's the other one, which is basically the uh, 
uh, how do I put this? Um, kind of turn or burn <laughs> might be the best way. A turn or burn <laughs> sensibility where it's just like, okay, um, excommunicate them now, get rid of them, crush them, preach hell uh, from the pulpit every Sunday. Yeah, inshallah. Uh, we will we will uh, start evangelizing, um, like, like send Dominicans into New York to start evangelizing all of the, like, heathen there and, and stuff Evangelism like that. sounds like a euphemism for something else. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like demonic cleansing of New York. Um, I was thinking of something else more Arabic, but go on. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, evangelization. <laughs> Yeah, um, so that's a that's sort of two ways. And the second way, uh, which I actually think is the, the proper way, seems like what it's going to do is obviously it's going to drive out a bunch of people. Like you'll have parishes in it, when uh, this starts getting applied, which probably get cut in half easily, easily. When you start um, kicking way women is the out. narrow that leads to life. Yeah, exactly. When you start kicking out women who are dressing a certain way, when you start sure. preaching the Catholic faith uh, in, in its sort of full vigor from the pulpit, when you start uh, withholding absolution from penitents uh, who aren't sufficiently contrite. And uh, when, when you start doing all of these things, um, what's going to happen is a lot of people are going to leave. That's very unfortunate that a lot of people are going to leave because a lot of these people aren't going to go to Protestantism. They aren't going to go to Eastern Orthodoxy. They're just never going to go back to church again. Yep. Um, and it sucks, of course, but really what the, the church, what happens to the church in that situation is in her smallness, she becomes purified and prepared for the, the new evangelization that, everybody keeps talking about in the Catholic church. So yeah, right. separating the wheat from the chaff. Exactly. Yeah. And, I, and I think this is really an issue of apostolic versus um, non-apostolic uh, pastoral practice as well. Uh, mm -hmm. It seems like there is the sort of issue of the toleration of the evil, um, uh, of the evil with the just, lest the, uh, lest the good be uprooted with the evil. There is that way in which we can speak, but there's also the sense in which we ought to speak that a little leaven leavens the whole lump Fair and enough. Fair a enough. little evil corrupts a lot of, a lot of people. Very true. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, now, unfortunately, that wasn't meant to be the last one, but flipping J. Athanasius here said he attached a question to the super chat. So I'll get to that. But first proto Protestant uh, donation to confirm the Vonarolo is cringe lol. Um, cool. Thanks for that. Thank you for increasing the beef on this uh, on this stream. Very cool, very cool, proto Protestant. Um, now to the actual uh, Athanasius just private messaged me, quoting me as saying, "Way is the narrow that leads to it." <laughs> Frick did I, did I actually say that? Oh man, way oh, is man. the narrow that leads to eternal <laughs> life. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that special subset of 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 um of slips of the tongue that's just hits the funny bone anyway real final question uh how can concupiscence be sin and christ have struggled with the human will in the garden um i'm not uh entirely so when christ struggled with the human will um yeah that's just a really weird way of, of stating it uh so we believe in diathelitism so christ uh struggled with his uh human will not really the human will um so when when it comes when it comes to oh wait concupiscence one concupiscence is in sin and uh, two we can have uh, for Adam Adam for example he could have certain dialectation or fear or uh, whatever that may be although he didn't have fear before the fall dialectation fear and so on of his sensitive faculties so concupiscence is the disorder between the sensitive. Uh, faculties and the intellectual faculties, but the sensitive cognition, sensitive appetite, and intellectual cognition, intellectual appetite, which is the intellectual appetite is the will. We can uh, talk about a preconscious uh, movement of the sensitive appetites not being concupiscence if, if there is some sort of uh, consent of the, uh, of the will. 
uh, at least virtually um, consenting to that movement. So, uh, for example, St. Thomas talks about with the, the marital use that, yeah, I know, cringe. Ah, he's about to talk about marital use. Um, I know the, the other Paul's giggling so hard right now. Uh, <laughs> um, with, with, with the marital use, uh, St. Thomas says that before the fall, the marital use would have been more pleasurable uh, for Adam but uh, it would not have overcome uh, his sensual, uh, his intellectual faculty as it does for uh, people in the earth. So all, I put all of this out there just to say that Christ could have the, the movements of the, uh, of the sort of disgust, uh, disgust is the right word, fear, maybe in an analogous sense, uh, but certain, certain movements uh, of his sensitive faculties away from uh, the the pain which he's about to feel with the consent of his uh, of his will at least virtually and not have it be concupiscence right okay thank you for that answer and unfortunately no more questions but there are there's so many of them given but we can't get to all of them because we had now just passed the two and a half hour mark and me and Christian do have to get on to our lives but Christian thank you so much for coming on this stream this was really awesome super educational and uh, God willing, we will do more of these in the future on other matters. So inshallah, uh, mash, uh, inshallah habibi. but uh, do plug yourself before we finish off. Uh, it's classic answers. Follow it. It's on YouTube. I'm also on Twitter. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess that's it. YouTube, Twitter and stuff. Too easy. Well, Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so much for watching this epic stream. This has been Christian Wagner of Scholastic Answers, and this has been The Other Paul. I hope you all have a lovely day or evening. God bless.